rare ones are the cotton top. So you're gonna get a finger monkey. You'll lose a finger monkey. They, but but they they get um they get 16 inches. Their body gets their torso is 16 inches long, and their tails are 20 inches long. But no, I want I want a, I want like a monkey. Like I want to put overalls and stuff on him. Not a, not just a diaper. What is? It sounds like cappuccino, but I can't remember. Capuchin. Yeah, and that's like a decent size. Yeah, those are the ones that turn the music boxes, yeah. and the guy with the cobra always has a capuchin monkey. Yeah, so like that's that's a manageable size, and it has a tail. Uh, I think it's highly reasonable. Yeah, it, it, I think why so. not? Uh, with monkeys, the problem with monkeys is when you say manageable size, uh-huh. um, monkeys are uh, hundred times stronger, retarded than strong, <laughs> retarded strong, and they have sharp fangs. And a little monkey this big will still eat your balls. Are we recording? Yeah. No. Awesome. Are we? Good. Oh, we are recording? I... We're, we're recording. Eat the balls. Yeah, the so, balls. I mean, monkeys are... I mean, I know a lot of people have monk, pet monkeys and stuff. If you want to see the rest of this, dangerous. you'll have to join the podcast. Okay. We're in the, oh, wait. How can we be in the podcast without... Is it loud? Reminds me. Holy shit, that was loud. Was, was loud? it loud in yours? Yeah, it mine was loud. really loud. Amanda's been wearing those, I guess. <laughs> Mine's not very loud. Okay, let's let's turn it up a little bit. Should we do a um a couples podcast where we give marriage advice? I mean, I don't think I'm eligible to give marriage advice. Why not? Because I'm like, you married the wrong bitch. Like <laughs> yeah, I say but, that all the time. But have you seen? Uh, I can't think of the guy's name. Uh, he's a, he's a black gentleman, you know, very well dressed. I don't know his name, and that's all he does, is give, like marriage advice, and he'll talk to women. TikTok and, guy or Instagram? Or uh, where I think are you I, I see him on YouTube. Okay, but he's, like, he's hundred percent real about everything. Like, girls will call in and they'll be like, "Why can't I get a man?" You know, and Kevin he, Gates is doing uh, his own fucking call in show it's fucking it's some of it's hilarious yeah and he's just it's awesome when he starts talking to these girls because he'll be like uh you're 35 years old you have three kids from three different you know and he he breaks it all down on why they don't have a man it's pretty it's pretty interesting he uses a fact yeah facts nobody likes facts nobody likes facts so if you're married with three kids from three different dudes you better be really fucking dirty i mean That'll help, but I think if you're mar- if you're if you have three kids from three different dudes and you're really dirty, you're probably still not going to ma- find she's, the right she's man. She's looking for number four. She's yeah. not looking for the right man. You're probably still not going to find the right guy. I just think it'd be funny with the girls. Yeah, I mean it might be. Might get us. They might not be happy that night. <laughs> <laughs> might be funny. Um, so how's your week going? Uh, good. What, I can't, I mean I can't complain. What it's cool just busy, shit have busy. you done this week? I went to Missouri and picked up the mini truck, and it's just... This you might have to get a dual state citizenship. I, I think I might have to. I mean, Missouri's... Are they machine gun friendly? I don't know. It's the show-me state, so... I feel like Missouri... I'm not playing footsie with you. No, I'm just... I'm just is, your thing, tr- is your thing working? Or I know, I had, to, I had to move, so I'm not really in the zone of the... We have this red light therapy thing. I'd show it to you, but I'm worried it would fry the camera. Yeah, it probably would it break the camera. It actually might. Who knows? So we literally unboxed it, and we have it on Jeff's knee here. Kind of. Kind of. It's fully adjustable. We just don't have it set up. It's got an app that comes with it. This is the small one. They make you know, full body. Could this be like Could this be like 1950 when the atom bomb first happened? Yes, and then, that's what I'm worried and about. And then nuclear energy was all the rage, and they're like, hey, you could take an X-ray of your foot at Foot Locker. And they had them, yeah. They yeah. really had those. <laughs> Where everything, we're going to, hey, you know what would be cool? If we had... Plates that were painted with paint that was exposed to radiation. That would be cool, too. Yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> and, and when you're painting the tritium on the uh, aviator yeah. watches, the best way to get the tip sharp is just to lick it. So that, that's, this could be that, where we're just like... So we saw, I've seen several x-ray machines, like the foot box yeah, x-ray foot machines, boxes, yeah. in antique stores. I'm like, hey, you know the radioactive shit's in here, right? I go, I don't care that you have it. Just be aware. Yeah. Department of Energy will fucking sooner or later somebody's going to say I, something. I saw somebody on YouTube that just does, um, they just do things about radiation. Like the guy goes to. I've seen him. He goes he to the San mines he and San he goes Nofre. all these places. Really good channel. <laughs> he did one where he found, he in a, 
you know, pawn shop or something. He found one of those foot boxes and he was taking it apart to see. And it was like, he goes, this damn thing is so dangerous and was putting so much radiation into people's feet. It's just unbelievable. That they even allowed it to be out on the street. Yep. 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 Did you see your light just turned on? Oh well, yeah, it did. Cody said 10 minutes. Yeah. How's your knee feel? I mean, warm. It's warm. It feels. People will be like, hey, I used this for like three days and I didn't notice that it worked, but I, then it dawned on me whatever was hurting didn't hurt anymore. Um, they make a full like tanning bed size one of these. It literally looks like a tanning bed. $65,000. Jeez. That's so a lot of. The ones Jerry has are panels on two, on three sides and you stand there for 20 minutes and it, it does strobes and other shit, put you into a seizure. Um, and from nearest I could tell, his system was about $10,000. So I bought this little one. I just figure I can set it, you know, in different what, what's positions. The, what's this little one cost? Seven hundred. Now they have they do have like a three hundred dollar unit. This had I think eight or nine wavelengths, whereas the ch- less expensive ones have like three wavelengths. But I just figured we we just try it out and see. Like yeah. when I get massages, I notice I don't. I feel good when I get a massage. Like I sleep probably the best ninety minutes. Really, I sleep probably about forty out of that. But I get the best rest out of the entire week while I'm being massaged. But where I really notice the massage is when I don't have a massage for a couple of weeks. Like we go out of town, miss her, or she's sick, you know, on Monday or whatever. I really do notice a difference when I don't have it. So I, I think that it does, you know, it drives blood flow. It helps, and it's very relaxing. So I'm just looking for any extra shit I can add on there. Maybe that would be good on your shoulder. Yeah, maybe. Um, and then there's a lot of other stuff uh, peptides. There's, there's yeah, peptides are supposed to be research. Really good. Is, you're, you're not supposed to use them on you. It's sold for your dog. Um, but you can get doctor prescribed peptides in the United States through U S compounding laboratories. And they have quite a few different ones that release, uh, HGH human growth hormone, but it doesn't have the negative cellular growth like, um, like you did with, um, SARMs like MK seven, seven, six, for instance. Um, and that shit worked. And you, anytime you have an injury or you're looking for speed of your recovery, that definitely does help. Like if you can actually get a growth hormone for injuries, just like, um, PRP platelet rich, um, what is it? Platelet, platelet rich plasma. I think it's like stem cells. It's right. It's less, they take your stem cells basically. Um, but you have to be close to the time of injury for that to benefit. Right. So if you have a pre-existing condition for years, it's not going to fix it. But uh, so you got the mini truck. I got the mini truck, and the Unimog is the Unimog is living large. So will you drive the mini truck more than the Unimog? Well, because I know you like your way. You're you're way out in the field with the Unimog doing whatever. Yeah, the Unimog. So you'll the, have to have somebody drive it, and then you'll drive them back, so the, you can use that as your go-to. Uh, well, really, the, because because of what I'm doing with the Unimog, the Unimog will kind of be an in-place item, and I'll just drive the mini truck back and forth each the, day. Input. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you're you got way more distance than I have, and I still ride stuff. Plus, it's cool. <laughs> yeah. People like people probably see the videos and they're like, "Man, John's so lazy. He's always." But if you had a cool four wheeler, wouldn't yeah. you find a reason to ride it every day? I mean, the mini truck is not. The, the mini truck is not a razor. It's not a, it's not a Can-Am. Which is probably good. <laughs> it's a, it's like, it's like a terrible, it's like a terrible 1980s four wheeler on steroids. With, with weatherproofing. With weatherproofing. Yeah. You, you have a cab, there's a radio in it. I got all kinds of lights on it. Um, it's just super fun to drive. Like I didn't get home till midnight last night. Tired, but the first thing I did was park park the big truck, undo the mini truck, and I drove the mini truck for an hour. I saw bed. Gina's post. She's like, "Come to bed <laughs> for an hour," just because it, it's just it's just. I'm it's, surprised she wasn't out there with you. And it's super quiet. Well, it was cold. It was 28. You and, got a heater, and she don't do the she don't do the cold. You know, you can get her some some overalls or bibs. That yeah, plug in. I had she's got a DeWalt full set of and, overalls. Uh, Milwaukee's got a, a so the Milwaukee has like twenty different jackets, yeah. so yeah. we can definitely get one get, that get she electric, likes the looks yeah. of, and it just runs off the battery packs. Um, so that's all I did. I ran around with it, and the you know the front struts and uh, need to be replaced every time you hit a nice <laughs> hole. It totally bottoms out. 
<laughs> but it's just fun, and it's it's amazingly how quiet it is for for what it is because it's just a it's like it, a three fifty or something six fifty. Uh, it's either a Honda or it's it's a motorcycle engine that's in it. Um, so it's pretty cool. It's just fun. It's just a fun thing to drive. It's got a dump bed and all that, so it's pretty cool. Have you seen any of the current events this week? Any of the news? Or I haven't seen anything. I mean, I know Russia took out some more infrastructure in Ukraine. Uh, Apparently, Ukraine's bombing shit within Russia too. Y- well, <laughs> well, we are probably. Yeah, we. When we gave him the when we gave him the high Mars, uh, Putin said, "You can you can't give him the long range. You can, you can give, him give him the short range shit. You can give him the short can't range let shit. Reach us. You can get the short range shit, but it, but if you give him the long range shit, you've crossed a line. Well, it seems, and you know I know, I keep saying don't worry about World War Three, but it seems every time Putin says if you do this, you've crossed a line, and Every time he every time he tells us not to do something, we just immediately do it. So, so we're going to run out of all the options, and the only option he's going to have is some really catastrophic shit. Maybe if he if he leveled Ukraine, would if, he simultaneously launch shit at us? No, I believe that I believe that Putin understands that if he stays within the confines of Ukraine. So if he does not step out of Ukraine, like maybe strike something in Poland or somewhere else, if he stays with the confines of Ukraine, that the European Union and the United States will look the other way. We won't do – so if he, if he bulldozes Ukraine into, you know, the ocean, which there's no ocean around Ukraine, but if he bulldozes Ukraine down to nothing, we'll be like <clears> – <throat> Oh, so so so, at, so we sad. Can't, so we bad. can't money launder anymore. Yeah, we can't money launder anymore. And the and the thing is, the money the money laundering is going to come to a crashing halt because of the way the election went. I mean, don't get me wrong; they're still going to be doing yeah, illegal all... shit. It's still going, but it's not going to be. Hey, we don't know where twenty nine billion dollars is. It's just going to be like, yeah, we're missing a million dollars, but who cares? Right? Yeah. It's fucking. Fucking yeah. nuts. Um, well, Poland did get bombed. Yeah, but by Ukraine. <laughs> Ukraine did it. Ukraine they came out it, so. and they're like, Russia, the U.S. missiles hit yeah. whatever. You know, Russian missiles hit Poland. This is an act of war. And then it was, you didn't hear shit more yeah. about it. Because every time, every time we they accused. Killed, killed two people. Every time we accuse the Russians of doing something uh, terrible, it's either Ukraine that does it or the Russians are like, uh we're not going to really do that. Like when the, when the, when the United States was saying there are no military bioweapons labs in Ukraine. And then it came out that there were 39 immediately after they said, Oh, by the way, there are 39 U S military bio labs in Ukraine. The press secretary came out and said, we believe that the Russians are going to use chemical weapons against biochemical weapons against the Ukrainians. Well, why would you say that? And what happened? The Russians actually took down U.S. bioweapons labs and didn't do shit. And you didn't hear shit about you didn't it. Hear, yeah, you didn't. They didn't do shit. It's the same thing with uh, when everybody, when everybody was talking about um, the Chernobyl power plant. Um, it's still a it's still a problem for Europe. There's another nuclear power. plant. Yeah, there's plant another nuclear you. power plant too. But the Chernobyl nuclear power plant is still a problem. And when they were fighting around that, and Ukraine was like, "Oh God, they're gonna." crack the sarcophagus and do a radiation cloud over all of Europe. The Russians moved in, held it, did not, did not do anything. Same thing with the power plants that they've been taking over that are active. They even left those power plants on so that Ukraine and European countries were getting power from those nuclear power. So it's, I mean, just the fact that those motherfuckers have any power at all. Yeah. I mean that, that if you have, if you're, this late in the war and people are like, Oh my God, they're attacking the infrastructure. They're still posting on Twitter. Yeah. That tells me that the Russians, when Putin said it was a a limited, that it was supposed to be a limited engagement and they were just trying to take over those uh, areas in the Donbass where they're heavily Russian minorities or heavy population of Russians live there. It's probably 100% what the mission was. 
because they didn't, if I think about every time the U S has attacked any country, what is the first thing we do? We annihilate their air defense and we destroy all the infrastructure. We turn the lights off. We EMP all their shit. Yeah, we turn the lights off. We make it so they can't, they can't freely operate. We control the airspace. The Russians didn't do any of that. So, I mean, you can say it's tactical. It's a tactical fault of the Russians, but it's also you could also say that because they were trying to conduct a limited engagement, just like they did when they took Crimea. Did you see um, Elon Musk in the last few days said, "Should I step down as CEO?" And whichever way the poll goes, so and he's stepping down. He's. Um, I don't believe he's stepping down. I believe. Well, that, the poll said. I mean, the poll was so like the next day. He was like, "Just kidding." Gotcha. Um, he actually banned. Fucking another step. I keep hearing billions. Like, I didn't realize there are billions of users on Twitter. They, yeah, it's worldwide. They they knocked down fucking seven, seven billion bots somehow. This this whole thing was a, a ruse. So could, that, could have been, because so he's, done it, he's go, done it a couple of times. They, where he, they data mined the account somehow and pulled out fucking billions more, killed off a bunch of these fake accounts, or he's saying they're fake accounts. But then I the next day I saw, he's like, I can't believe you guys fell for that. And I mean, I don't know if what I saw was just like a, a meme somebody made. Right. I don't, I don't know. Uh, I mean, but the, there's some Saudi princes that are still highly involved in that. They've already put somebody's gone to prison over allowing access to uh, Twitter information to Saudi princes. There is somebody that is currently incarcerated over that. One of his, and this could just be, you know, outside of Saudi princes, it could just be corporate corporate espionage because his biggest rival when he was going mm-hmm. to buy Twitter was a Saudi, one of the Saudi, yeah. you know, whatever prince or so that, that could just be corporate espionage where they're trying to, I don't know what, who cares? It's Twitter guys. It's Twitter. It's same thing with Facebook. They're both dumb. <laughs> If you could imagine, though, if you could turn off, if you could turn off social media during voting, which how the voting. But then again, you wouldn't know. They could just fucking put their shit in the computer and you wouldn't know it happened. Yeah. Which which they've done and which they are currently doing. It's to the point where it can't be fixed. No, it can't. It can't be fixed. So if you could only own if preppers preppers, right, homesteaders, preppers, guys that are interested in your government's coming after you. At, at what scale are they going to come after you? Right. So. You, you're a prepper. You want to be a prepper. What if they could only own one gun? What gun should a new prepper own? The gun of America, an AR-15. Okay. If they could have a second one, what would you recommend them have? A shotgun. What about a third? Another AR-15. You're not gonna go with a pistol. They don't. No, they don't but, need to be able to go concealed. But, I, I don't. I don't want to burst anybody's bubble out there in the in the training world or in the in the John Wick world. But rifle trumps pistol. If you go to a rifle fight with a pistol, first off, you're gonna shit yourself because it's it's not a real there's it's not a real it's not a real option. A pistol is a defensive tool for oh shit, oh my god, I'm backed in a corner. This is all I have. Rifle trumps pistol every single time. A you, you, the issue with the issue boils down to this: if you want to be proficient with the, if you want to be proficient with a pistol, if you want to John Wick it, thousands and thousands and thousands of rounds have to go downrange for you to be super proficient. Okay, you can't take a weekend training course. I, I hate to again burst people's bubble, but you can't go to fucking you know John Wick Junior School one time. And you're going to be proficient enough with that pistol in order to fight the government. Uh, you can become very proficient with an with a rifle without shooting as many rounds. And again, rifle trumps pistol every time. So every time. Was it Dick? Dick? FBI guy. Liaison. Oh, uh, yeah. What did he say? You you carry a pistol to fight to your secondary. You carry yeah, a secondary you, to fight to your car. You have enough stuff in your car to fight to your tertiary location. Yeah, you you the pistol is just to be able to get you to a rifle. First time I heard that was in a shopping mall, on an escalator, with some suitcases. That Probably had, that had MP5s. MP5s in them. MP5s in them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, the, the reality is, you you carry a pistol 
because you can't go into Walmart with a rifle. Right. Yes, so that's, exactly, that's your, exactly. that's your and that's, best. That's how the instructors sell those classes. Yeah, that's your, that's your best bet is your, a pistol is a, is a good concealable defensive tool. Again, did you hear what I just said? Defensive tool. It's a good defensive tool. If you. Because it's better than a screwdriver. Yeah. If you're going to go, if you have to fight the government. If for what I, I just I, say. And let's just say. And I, and I, I narco, guess I, those shouldn't have gone together. Yeah, the government nar- thing. Narco terrorists. Uh, narco terrorists are coming out of the hills to steal all your potatoes. Uh, a pistol is a good defensive tool, but those narco terrorists are going to show up with rifles and they are going to get your potatoes. Now, if you have a if you have an, a rifle, an AR-15, that is technically an offensive weapon. I know, I know, people are going to get mad because everybody wants to ban those. Uh, it is also a defensive weapon, but you can go on the offense with an AR-15. You cannot do that with a pistol. And if you, I don't care who you are, if you think you can, you're an idiot. You've uh, been watching too many John Wick films. A bunch of their bands are getting just shot to shit. Oh God, the the, the supreme. It's almost like there's two different governments. Well, the the issue is, you can hate John, you can hate uh, Donald Trump all you want, but if you are on the right and you believe that, you believe that. Uh, in gun rights, and you believe in the Second Amendment, he saved the country because of his Supreme Court picks and how the Supreme Court is going right now. I mean, it, it, when you see uh, when you see Congress legislating that they're going to do a ban on whatever, doesn't matter what it is, or all these states that are doing it, the way the Bruin decision went down is they're screwed. They Cal- can't. Apparently, all the all the regulations in California are about to fucking yeah, just they're, vaporize. They're, they're about to vaporize because of the way the decision was written, and because of the way the decision was written, if you if you look at what Bloomberg, so Bloomberg is one of the biggest anti gunners out there. But it's tons of money behind. Yeah, tons of money. And if you look at what Bloomberg is doing now, he is no longer doing. Let's ban assault rifles. Let's ban this. Let's ban that. He is propagating. Let's get rid of the Second Amendment. Let's deal with the Second Amendment because that's really their only choice. They're, they they can't. Well, he's saying Canada and Australia right now. Well, they, I mean, the issue with here's the thing. Uh, why sorry, does, why does Bloomberg want it? To ban sorry, why Canada is that his pet project. Well, because he's a he's a globalist. Because you he ha- knows. if you're a globalist, you have to get rid of you have to get rid of privately owned firearms. I mean, if you think about uh, Wuhan, China, not Wuhan. Yeah, God damn it. all, all of, it's it's Wuhan. It's not. But I'm at the. Uh, I think it's it's Shanghai right now, maybe a bunch you, of them. It, yeah, if you think about how do you how do you lock forty million people in their apartments, and they're not even sharpening you, sticks. You uh, you take away all their guns. That's their, how you their do will it. Will is broken. Yeah. So I mean, it's, it's just it's crazy, but they have to. The, you're going to see that the anti the, you're going to see the anti gun establishment is going to start squeaking away from the way they have been approaching this and go directly after the second amendment. They're going to want to go after the second amendment. The problem they have is they're not going to, even if they do a convention of States, they're not going to have enough States in order to get rid of the second amendment. So it, it's interesting. I see a bunch of stuff, but you're going to have two separate United States. I, one could argue that we already do. I, yeah. One could argue that we already do. I mean, I, who who thinks if they go to San Francisco that they're... Well, Oregon just said they, some shit went out to Oregon or Washington, and they're like, we don't give a shit what the feds say. You were, you're taking your fucking guns. Like, you can't yeah. have these. The problem that most, manipul- m- most municipalities don't understand, like in Oregon, when they... When, when a when a politician stands up and rattles the saber and says, we're taking your guns, he really doesn't understand that he doesn't have enough police officers to do that. Or the will. Well, of, I mean, of he, those police officers. he may have the will. Right. Sure. right? But the, you know, you have to remember that there's a, probably an AR-15 in the house next door to you. So when you start going door to door, it's okay. It's easy it is easy to specifically target an individual and go after their firearms. If the police department, if you know, if the Camden PD wanted to get Bill's guns and they specifically target Bill and they're like, hey, he's a drug dealer, we're going to raid his house, confiscate his guns. That's easy. 
But when you say the municipality of Benton County can no longer have AR-15s, we're confiscating every AR-15 in Benton County, you've outnumbered yourself. You're yeah. just, you're, it only takes one or two people. It really only takes one or two people to go, fuck you, you're not taking my shit. How many shootouts could the police actually have? They're well, only the going to have would, a couple. They it, it would be a... A Ruby Ridge thing again. It would be. A, well, that's what I'm saying. It would be a you can, branch Davidians. Yeah, you can specifically, you know, you can specifically target individuals. So, you know, Ruby Ridge or the branch Davidians. Well, I'll use the branch Davidians as an example because they were in a in a small Texas town. If the federal government had, if the federal government t- attacked Ruby Ridge specifically for the sole purpose of taking their weapons, like if they you said mean Mount Carmel. Mount Carmel. Yes, yes, I'm sorry. Mount Carmel. If they were going to attack that specifically to take guns, which they weren't, that's not why they were there, um, and the town of Waco showed up with their guns, that operation would immediately cease. Th- those well, federal even, agents... Even at Ruby Ridge, they set the perimeter 10 miles back. Yeah. Like, because there were fucking skinheads showing up. Uh, Bo Grites showed up. There were fucking a bunch of gun owners who were not they they made them out to be white supremacists and definitely there probably were some there yeah of course but there was a lot of other people there that's why they set that perimeter that perimeter was set up like in fucking two towns over yeah so the fbi you know first off the the fbi cannot operate without local authorities assistance so whenever the fbi does anything the first thing they do is they're talking to the sheriff's department and they're talking to the police department and they're getting that support because the FBI can't hold that cordon. Well, the ATF was slated to be dissolved. Yes. They were, they were losing their budget. Yeah. And the ATF now falls under the FBI's budget. I don't yeah. know how close that was to uh, Waco there. The only reason, here's a But the little, sheriff, and I mean, you, I believe I heard a, a briefing. I thought that you had given, or I sat in on, I got to sit on a briefing somebody gave to one of the sniper schools specifically about Ruby Ridge. And I remember, and I also saw the sheriff on video after the fact say, we spoke with the FBI and said, hey, do not enter the compound. David Koresh runs into town and eats at this cafe every morning. I will just come in and we will disarm him and you can question him. So at the time, the ATF's budget was in, at the time the ATF's budget was in question. And this, this is the reason why you have such good video of the raid is because the ATF invited all media outlets to go with them on the raid because the ATF believed that this was just going to be like a, a clean and sweep. They would go through and all their black gear and their guns and look cool and arrest David Koresh and parade him in front of the cameras. Well, again, it only takes one person. And one person in that compound decided that they weren't going to be able to take him. And ATF had the worst day of its, you know, of its government career. They had the worst day of their government career. Now, I'm not anti-government or, well, I guess I am, but not really. Uh, I know that those ATF, that most of those ATF agents that were showed up there that day were just, they they were doing their job. They, you know, they just showed up to work and they're doing their job. Um, But again, it was, they were showboating. They were showboating in order to be like, hey, we we still need a budget. And that showboating is what got them their asses handed to them. Because the sheriff did say, I can arrest him. I can arrest him. I can go put the cuffs on him right now, bring him to you. And they're like, no, we're going to do it this way. So that just tells you that they were just showboating the entire time to, to get more funding. And ultimately, the only thing that saved them was... Uh, their arson investigation. The ATF has the one of the best arson investigation divisions in the in the government, and that's what saved them is the arson investigation. So which, you they they broadcast live as this was happening. I yes. remember watching it on CNN, uh-huh. and there was a, a two story building, and there's a one story that runs perpendicular yes. into it. The ATF had a ladder right there, and there were two guys on the ladder. And the first dude slipped and stitched some MP5 rounds through. Do you remember when uh, Pat Rogers was doing the transition course, Mm -hmm. Force used to run safety off on the MP5s because the triggers were so heavy? And then on the M4, they ran safeties on. Safeties on, yeah. I had an MD on the ship, and I actually fucking jammed. I I had a round go off, 
I, I, I didn't have my finger. It caught on something on my, on right. my gear, but a, a blank round went off when we were doing the ship takedown right. stuff. So that, I remember that sticking in my head, but the ATF dudes fired the first rounds. And yes. that's what everybody in the compound said. The ATF denies that to this day. Well, it, and the footage fucking disappeared for years until the VHS tapes started getting sold at the gun shows. Technically the ATF is correct. They didn't, they didn't, they didn't fire the they first rounds. The they first indeed rounds. the first rounds. They indeed the first rounds. And it's, it's actually not as, um, uh, uncommon. It's, it's not as uncommon as you think. You've had many ATF agents shoot themselves in, in including in front of a school class. Well, I'm, I'm just saying MP5 in general, uh, the Marine Corps, we had a, we had an incident where, uh, some guys got stitched up the back with an MP5 once. On that, because again, they were running them off safe because the safety is kind of weird on the MP5. It's not, it's not that you can't manipulate it, but when you're, when you're trying to teach everybody to be dynamic, then you take the safety off as soon as you stack on the wall, and no safety's inside the house. Um, and you know, there's several. You can go to range one. Uh, <laughs> oh, it's, I, don't I don't even think it's, think it's classified anymore. anymore. You can go to range one sixteen to the shoot house, and there are several bullet holes in the in the stairwells. That's the seals ship structure. Uh, yeah, that's the that's the the ship structure. But there are several bullet holes in the floor from Navy SEALs because of uh, NDs. Um, I know that uh, you had a team guy who shot himself out at uh, Portrero Range. Um, fucking MP, I think it was MP five. Something got caught on a fucking flux cuff. Yeah, it, I mean it. You know the the mission that the mission that the uh, the SWAT guys do and the SEALs and the Force Recon guys it's a dangerous mission, and it it doesn't take much for you to step from safety to danger, you know to have an ND or anything like that. It doesn't take much. So, you know, when when somebody's telling you they've never had an ND or it's kind of like riding a motorcycle. It's it's not when you're going to have an axe. It's it's I mean it's not if you're going to have an axe. It's when you're going to have an axe. It's always it's always possible. That's why you have to be vigilant in what you're doing. Uh, you know, when they're doing dynamic breach entries, though, that's when there's a problem because you're you got all kinds of other things going on. You're blowing shit up. You're you know people are yelling at you. So it's it's a uh, it's it's interesting. Do you remember that crazy fucking sniper rifle, Chris? I guess he made it. I don't. We were, we were out at the um, with the at the cowboy range with the trigger that you can blow on. I got down behind <laughs> the gun. I didn't even I didn't even get to the trigger, and the fucking gun went off. Uh, with the trigger you can blow on. I mean, I I get why people think that they need a, a trigger that uh, or just do a, a double set trigger. <laughs> they, they they these people think they need a trigger that's a half a pound. If I, if I, a hair follicle falls on it, the gun's gonna go off because I'm so accurate. Um, the truth of the matter is, it's just training. It's it's just training. It, that's all it is. Is training. Doesn't matter if you have a a, a military eight pound trigger in your M4 or a Geisley superset. Can you shoot faster with the with the a Geisley trigger? Yes. But relative, it doesn't matter, right? It it matters if you're going to go shoot three gun and you're going to shoot against Jerry Micklick. Yeah, you need that tenth of a second. You know, you need that tenth of a second to make he'll, a difference. He'll still beat you with a fucking yeah. stock Glock. <laughs> but with a but in a real gunfight, nope. That's a that's it's a it's a fallacy that training the the uh, the training world wants you to believe it. Does it's a tenth of a second's not going to make you a fucking difference. So, are you still of the belief that the the Glock um, nineteen is the best pistol in the world? I mean, God, if you're, you, dude, you should, if you're a gangster, you should read the comments from when we made that video. They're still commenting on that. If if you're a gangster, the Glock is, the Glock was a under the Glock was an under engineered piece of junk that was put on the market in order to be. It, the the reality is, what's that gun that everybody buys now? That's made out of pot metal. Uh, it's the number Larson, one Jennings, no, it's the number one selling gun in America. Uh, I would, I say high, point. high point. High point is the number one selling pistol in America. Still, uh, I haven't heard. I have not heard the ter- word high point in oh, man. five years. Probably it's the number one. High point Since is the number they did one that cash print one. Number one selling pistol in America. What, okay, they asked to do the name, and everybody wanted to call them what they want to call it. The yeet. Yeah. yeah, and the reason why it's the number one selling pistol in America is because it's cheap, 
right? If you if Both. you go into a pawn store and cheap, yeah. You, if you go into a pawn store, you can find a high point. You can find a high point pistol for hundred bucks, right? Can you really? Yeah. Oh yeah. That was the reality. Is what what all the Glock fanboys don't want to tell you, don't want to don't want to own up to, is when yeah. the Glock came out. That's what the Glock was. The Glock was the cheapest gun on the market, and that is why every gangster had one. They did not have them because they were high capacity, because they had, they were accurate, they were great guns. But they did, they did work though. Yeah, they did work. Again, they did work. And by the way, so do high points. Like but people you couldn't. We were going to the range and putting a thousand rounds through a pistol. Yeah, I mean that's like, not, that's, like in a day. But, but you couldn't have fucking done. You did. We did that with a, a Glock 17. We did that with 21s. Yeah. Uh, I, it, did we do 21s? Yeah, because that's uh, Cody's mother always shot the 21 better than the than yeah. the than the nine millimeters. So, like, we were taking ammo cans full of ammo and leaving yeah. with empty ammo cans, and never cleaned those guns. Not I'm, at the I'm range. Not, but you couldn't have done that with a high point. Uh, yeah, they do them with high points. Go look at look at Grantham. Grantham takes a high point and tries to destroy it, run it over. Do I mean he eventually blows it up because it is because the high point is pop metal. But the truth of the matter is, go ahead and look up catastrophic failures with Glocks. Glocks blow up too. Glocks blow up too. Glocks malfunction. Glocks if you don't hold a Glock right, it won't fire right for you. You know, um, the first Glock 19 I had, Chris Hayes bought it, or the first Glock 19 I shot, Chris Hayes bought it. And for whatever reason, every time the damn thing, every time I would fire the thing, the brass would eject straight up in the air and hit me in the forehead. <laughs> Never. I was like, fuck this. It's a cheap, it's a cheap gun. Uh, and again, Were you using I'm not kill shot. Were you firing? Kill uh, shot? Yeah, I was firing kill shots. I'm not, I don't, I'm not specifically bashing Glock again. It's a good gun and all that. But if you look at the fanboy stuff, what are we on? What are we like? Gen 19. We're like, Gen 40, and I they, it, I think it's five, and everything they do, you know, every time they do an upgrade, it's like, oh, hey, hey, Glock, Glock fanboys, we put an extra serration on the front of the gun. You so need to buy the Gen 5 gun. The <laughs> first, just, the, the one I had, you couldn't drop the mags out. <laughs> they weren't drop free mags because they didn't have the metal in the polymer in the mags oh, yeah, or yeah, something. Yeah. I remember having to like pull the mag yeah. out when you'd hit the mag. That release. was probably like a European because the Europeans are real big on that. They don't want, for whatever reason, they don't want your mags to fall out of your gun but i mean again i know the glock fan boys are going to go nuts but you know the, the they will tell if you, if you take a look at terran tactical right yeah that's a three thousand dollar glock and the complaint was you know the 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 complaint sure, in the 80s cool. was the complaint was in the 80s was was every all the other firearms that were being made had to be customized in order to be and they had to be all tricked out if you wanted to go really shoot them. Well, that's the same thing with the Glock. I mean, it, it's no different with the Glock. They're doing all the same things. The reality is we're doing all the same things to the Glock that they were doing to 1911s in the 80s. Where You're sending them off to, yeah. you know, I, you can get a goddamn Wilson combat Glock, okay? I didn't know that. Yeah. I you, no we're idea. sending them off to all these high-speed guys to do all this tricked-out stuff to them to make them fancy and shoot fast. Same thing we were doing in the 80s with 1911s. And right now, what everybody is, what everybody's coming to terms with, even a lot of Glock fanboys, and if you're, if you're true to the sport of shooting, you will recognize this as a fact. What a lot of people are understanding now is, single action trigger is better than anything Glock can do. Those striker fire, the striker fire triggers, are terrible compared to a single action trigger, and that's why. So they're going back to 1911s. People are pushing back towards a single action firearm. Do you think that's but in nine millimeter? Because uh, okay. yeah, because the testosterone level is much lower in the youth of today. It's not as high, so wrist strength that's, is terrible. That's a real thing. Um, Ri wrist strength is terrible, so they can't really shoot a full load like so a forty five. Would would could we could we meet middle of the road with thirty eight super? I mean, we could. It would be kind of cool if somebody brought thirty eight super back. Did you find me Cobra boots? What, cobra boots? What do we need Cobra boots for? Because well, like every, every 38 Super 1911 in the world is in Mexico or has been in Mexico. Yeah. And I keep seeing... The, you remember when we go down to Tijuana to the 
the bazaar, and they'd have those boots that had the cobra heads on them and the belt buckles. Uh-huh. So the the new like narco drug thing now is who has the tallest cobra on the boot. Have you not seen this? I haven't seen. Oh I, my I've god! Seen the, Ed Ed will know where to get them. I've seen the boots where they put the they have that just like that ramp yeah, coming yeah, off yeah. of the huge ramp. Yeah, I like the backflip ramp. No, yeah. it's a cobra. <laughs> they put a I cobra. Mean, why not? Why not? If you're if you got look if you got drug kingpin money, why not? It's it's the COVID. Well, like there's a bunch of uh, there's a bunch of U.S. citizens that are moving to Colombia and apparently living pretty fat. Uh, I mean, you 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 go south of the border, you're going to live pretty fat. I think it's like if it's you like, got a decent income stream, it's like South Africa. Most of it's a shithole, and then there's the whole yeah. Cities they build that are uh, off. They build their they you basically build a an expatri an expat pat uh, area, and that's where the you know you go when there's a, fucking domino's pizza and shit you're like what the hell yeah because they they just build those expat areas i mean if you go to like if you go to patia beach in thailand or even bangkok i think most most of the places are run by expats most of bars for sure yeah they're most of them run by expats so you can you can make a pretty good living so what pistol what's your daily pistol a glock do you like when you wake up in the morning are you like eeny meeny miny mo sometimes i do eeny meeny miny mo Sometimes it's it's a tough it's a tough call, but uh, Glock. Again, remember I just bad mouth Glock for like a half hour, but a Glock is my daily carry. Which Glock? It is the f- single stack nine millimeter. I don't know what it is. Were you here? Were you here when Justin showed up with his truck and he had, and he the had big, like yeah the big the truck? He had a truck vault, the two drawer <laughs> truck vault, and he's like, I got some. We were gonna shoot a fox out here. The fox was eating the chickens. And he's like, Oh, I got it. I go, You got a you got a twenty two with? It? He's like. I got a Glock. I'm like, oh, which Glock we got? He's like, oh, I have all, all of them. All of them. All of them. <laughs> and he did, he didn't even know what what the like. He literally had every fucking model of Glock yeah, you could get. Every model in his truck. <laughs> yeah, in, in the, the vault, in the, in the vault. vault, and they had yeah. it all custom laser cut for the yeah. for the pistol. It, it was it vault. was awesome. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. It was cool. Awesome. Yeah. I've never seen him fire a gun. Hmm. He didn't shoot the fox. No, oh. <laughs> no. I mean, sometimes it's just about how cool the guns look. It was, it, they looked cool. They looked and cool. So I what, carry, I carry the single, I, it's a single stack nine millimeter. I don't, I don't know what the norm, cause first off Glock, you had a great opportunity to come right, out with to a, to fix your numbers, to fix your numbers and you didn't do it. So I'm, I'm not following your Pokemon game. Um, but the truth of the matter is I carry the Glock and you should think about this when you're carrying your firearm is if you ever have to use it, the police are going to confiscate it. Rightful shooting or not, they're going to confiscate it, and they're going to keep it for like five years. So, so should they carry a throwdown gun? I no, mean, they're going to know, guys. Yeah, don't. They're there's know. no such. That's there's, a joke. There's, there's no such. Don't thing pull as a throwdown them. Gun. Don't pull them inside your house. Only the only people who have throwdown guns are uh, cops officers. from New Jersey. Um, but anyway, so you, yeah, it's the it's the gun that I'm going to be least upset if the police take it. So, what's your going to war pistol? I mean. Musoc forty five. Musoc forty five. That's the going to work because here's the here's the thing that here's the thing that people does Musoc know, still exist? It does still exist. I think they all have Glocks now. I mean, yeah, I think they're I so think they're the all running Musoc armors are building like I don't seventeens. I don't know what. Tell them what the Musoc pistol was. A lot of guys listening. Uh, know. It, it started at basically the Musoc the Musoc program was a program that started in the early 80s i believe for the marine corps and it was basically special they were trying to it was marine expeditionary special operations special capable. operations capable they were trying to create these this organization to compete with special forces and the good thing about musoc was you know if you're a green beret you're in fort bragg or you're in fucking well Benning. J- jsoc said hey we want a special operations capable group unit from every branch and the marine corps said fuck you every yeah. marine is a rifleman and so the Marine Corps started the MUSOC. So they didn't get funding. Yeah. Well, no. They didn't it, get the, the Marine Corps started the MUSOC program because JSOC is in Florida, sun tanning, having a good time. Marines are everywhere in the world. So by the time, the, the, the way the Marine Corps worked that program is when the president picked up the phone and he's like, the embassy in Libya is being attacked, we need operators on it. The Marine Corps is like, hey, man, we're just hanging out in the ocean right there off the coast, and we have a MUSOC that's ready to go. 
where the degree, you know, where the where J is highly like, ready to go. Where J like, okay, if you give us twenty four hours, we're gonna put the boats in the airplanes, and then we're gonna take C fives. I'm gonna fly, and we're gonna drop the boats out, and then we're gonna lose somehow half, we're half gonna the get boats are gonna yeah somehow we're gonna get rangers out there to protect the boats that the guys are but where the marines are like, hey, we got everything. I mean, we got our own aircraft, our own helicopters, our own boats. And we got Force Recon on here that's all CQB qualified door kickers. And so it was a really good program for the Marine Corps to stay relevant because that was the issue. The issue was in the 80s and 90s, everybody was fighting for money. You know, even the, even the ninjas, even the ninjas, they were fighting for money back then. And you had to stay relevant. And the MUSOC program is what kept the Marine Corps relevant because we were there. We were already there. You know, when, uh, when Black Hawk happened, when Black hawk down happened the army and the you know the army and the air force could they have done something maybe but they really couldn't like not the force projection that a musoc brings right so a musoc again helicopters aircraft artillery tanks not a lot of tanks i mean there's only a couple of tanks but you know a tank in somalia is way cooler than against the Russians. And that's like the Marine Corps forte. And we could put that on the ground immediately where nobody else could do that. And so that's what, that's why if you, if you take a look at what was going on with the Marine Corps in the eighties and nineties, everywhere there was something going on in the Pacific theater, the Marines were there. It was, you know, Liberia Marines were there everywhere. There was something going on. The Marines were there in some sort of MUSOC support role. I mean, even when the coal was blown up, yeah, it was Marine snipers on the coal. So, because we were force projecting and those those units were out there. So, the MUSOC program was a really good program for the Marine Corps and ultimately, failure of Marine Corps leadership destroyed the program. But, uh, the were, pistol, go ahead. basically the, uh, the force recon platoons wanted to have a, a more accurate pistol and to go along with the MP5. I don't know how they chose a 1911. I, I am going to assume that it was strictly because the Marine Corps had 40,000 of those bad bears sitting in Barstow, and they took World War II guns. So not Model 70s. They were Model They were. No, they weren't Model 70s. They were pre. Pre-Model 70s. Um, they took World War II guns. They sent them to Quantico. The, the back then. Springfields. Those were Colts? Col they were, well, they were a mix because I had an Ithaca. And that definitely was a World War II gun. Um, so they were sending these World War II guns to Quantico and the old crusty armors there, because back then they were the old crusties. It wasn't none of these young fangle kids that are using CNC machines. It was old crusties with like the glasses that had glasses on top of glasses Could and they make shit out of nothing. And they would make shit out of nothing. They took those those World War II 1911s and they created what they called the MUSOC 45. Now it had uh it had a, a Barstow barrel. It had uh, Bomar sights on it. Um, you know, they did some spring package stuff. They did a little bit of work on the trigger. They were nice guns. Uh, they didn't have rails because, again, this is pre this is pre rails. So they had to have a light that hooked through the um, that surefire six volt thing. Yeah, Crazy. they had to. It, 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 and that those damn things would snap off all the time. But uh, it was a good gun. I mean, I had. I, when I went through the CQP course, I had an Ithaca. So Ithaca, they were only made during World War II. So it was, a, it was definitely a World War II gun. It had no blooming on it. Um, and the round count book had 80,000 rounds in it when I got the gun. And I, I went through the qual course with that pistol. And I, I can't remember, but I think, I think you shoot 2,000 rounds through that course. Uh, you, you do a week of... I'm I'm probably messing this up, guys, because this was this was 20 years ago. You do I think it's a week and a half of pistol before you transition to MP5. So it's just and there's a week of fighting while wounded in there. Yeah, so you you, you, use pistol. you get up at eight o'clock in the morning. I mean, you don't get up at eight o'clock in the morning, but you're on the range at eight o'clock in the morning, and you leave the range when the sun goes down, unless you're doing night fire, and then you're there until midnight. So it, it they. In those days, I don't know what it's like now, but in those days, those force recon platoons put some rounds down. I mean, <laughs> this is how crazy, this is how crazy, how much ammo they fired. 
you would do you would do malfunction drills, right? So every now and then they'd have to do malfunction drills, and so they would do malfunction drills. And at the end of the day, I would go out on the because you know, force recon is just like Delta Force. They don't pick up their own brass. They just leave their shit on the ground. So at the end of the day, I would they go always out, wonder how it gets cleaned up. Yeah, at the end of the day, I would go out there and I'd be like, ooh, piece of candy, piece of candy. I'd be picking up the brass because you know I I fancied myself a reloader back then, and I would fill up an ammo can of live ammunition that i mean that's how many times they're doing malfunction drills and shit and it's just it was crazy how much how much ammo that they fired out of th- i mean they were f- i know if there's a force recon guy out there that's right now is like 2932 he they know exactly how much ammo they fired but uh it was a lot and then when you got to the mp5s it was just mag after mag after mag. and they were doing all that you know in the the glory days of musoc they were doing all that uh semi-auto like they had they were full auto navy guns they were uh, mp5 the navy version and they were full auto and you would go to the when you go into the cqb course they'd be like okay load up a mag go down the range put it on full auto fire that's the last time you're ever going to do that <laughs> everything's going to be in in semi and i'll tell you what those guys were fast fast and accurate when it was done enough so that i would put as far as accuracy and speed goes I would put a, any 1985 to 95 Force Recon Platoon against any same time period Delta Platoon. And the only reason why was because i seen the targets. Just, you know, the, 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 at that time, the Marine Corps, at that time in the Marine Corps, uh, at that time in the Marine Corps, speed and accuracy was the thing. Uh, and I believe at that time, Delta, it was about speed. So it didn't, you didn't, you know, you weren't really looking for a tight shot group. What you were looking for is rounds on target. But I mean, downtown Los Angeles, Force Recon Platoon never missed a target. I know some of you Delta guys did. I saw, I saw, I saw some daylight coming through the wall once. Yeah. So somewhere. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's interesting. But so the Musoc pistol, basically, it was a just kind of a hyped up 1911. And then, I don't know why, you know, contra- I guess it's it's just the way contracts work. They started getting, I don't know if Springfield Armory was first. Uh, but anyways, they started getting parts. They would get the complete gun from Springfield Armory, and it would be in a box, completely taken apart. And then the armors would put it together and put their little spin on it or whatever. And that, that became the Musoc pistol. But the Musoc pistol is actually transitioned... I believe through four different pistols. So we went uh, Springfield. I believe that there were some Kimbers in there. Not 100% sure. I'm not I'm not a Force Recon aficionado. Uh, and then they went to Colts. And then they went back to something else. Uh, so there's there's been different companies that have made the, that have made those guns. But by far, the best guns were the, were the first ones they made out of those World War II ratty. I mean, like you could take my you could take my top when it was closed and go click 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 click. But that gun shot. Pour sand through it. That gun shot, and it had eighty thousand rounds through it. So, Who knows how many World War II rounds went through it? So that eighty thousand round gun was issued to you. It was issued you went to me. Through CQ. Did you CQ? deploy with that pistol? No, 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 no. I wasn't. I wasn't part of the force recon because uh, when I was at SOTG, I was a sniper instructor there, and you could, you know. Which is kind of interesting. I could go and take, I could go through the CQB package, but no force recon guys ever came and went through the sniper pack. None of the instructors, anyways. I think, the, I think they, at because the, there were force recon guys that went through sniper school. They just yeah, didn't yeah. go through the RNS package. They just didn't go through the RNS package. And I, I think uh, it just, you know, our schedule was a little, I think it's probably because our schedule was a little more flexible. Than theirs because they had a they had a tight schedule. Those guys were when the when the Musoc picked up and it was time to start. Those guys were working straight through interoperability and all that. So they they had a tight schedule. Where our schedule is a little more flexible. It's why all the CQB or I'm sorry, all the sniper instructors got to go to fucking dive and Halo and jump school and all you know ranger school and all that because the quotas would still come to SOTG because we were. Because Force Recon was there. So Force Recon's there. You still get these quotas and you still get to jump out of airplanes and do all that stuff. But the Force Recon guys would be like, I don't have time for that shit. You know, it, 
both obviously most of them were already gold wing guys and some of them had scuba bubbles but again if a dive quota came up for combat dive they can't they just didn't have the time to send a guy to combat dive especially with the package they were running yeah that's what i'm saying with the package was so it was it was pretty tight their their package was pretty tight they they worked they worked some pretty good hours because so real quick before so if if a Force dude had been issued that Ithaca with 80,000 rounds. That's the gun he would have deployed with. Well, okay. At that time, all of the, all of the original MUSOC guns that were left, I want to say there was 18 of them. So these are the original guns. They had given those to SOTG as the SOTG training guns. Don't lose these. Yeah, don't lose these. The Force Recon guys were already using a Got second it. generation because everything I saw when anytime I was around there, everything was always Springfield. Yeah, they were already using second generation. Do you think any of those guns that were ever issued to those dudes? Do you think any of those guys have possession of those guns? I would say not. I that's a tough. That's a tough one. I would say not the originals, because as far as I know, this last group of Colt 1911s that went to Afghanistan and then was released back to Colt is the only time they've ever done that. Um, so if, in fact, you went to, you know, I, I don't know what year it was, if you went to Afghanistan with the last uh, MUSOC pistols, you could have your MUSOC pistol because it went to Colt, Colt authorized, you know, got it. put a letter in it and said, this is a MUSOC 45. Because they were building those out of Quantico, right? Yeah, they were, they, well, they were putting them together at Quantico. Yeah. And then that, and then those were sold on the open market. Those those Afghanistan Musoc forty fives. Well, I, ma- I messaged Jack Carr was looking five for grand. one. Jack was looking for one, and I'd messaged you about it. Oh yeah, the, those old ones would be tough to find. It'd be tough to find. I, you, he was looking for an Afghanistan one, I think. Oh, was he? I, I mean, so. I think he I think he got one. I hope he did because the initially those things were going for like twelve hundred bucks, and I was like, mm, that's kind of expensive for something you're not really you're not really going to shoot, and man, they're. Go look them up right now. They're six grand, dude. I think I found. I think the one I found for them was eight. Yeah, they're because it, it's a limited. You know, it's one of those things, limited run, and you I don't think get it's just when dudes you get have it. it, and they're like, yeah. "This is what it costs for me to." I not mean, have look, it. look at, go ahead and look up how much a debt one pistol costs. Yeah, <laughs> you know, there was a very limited run of debt one pistols, yeah. and those things are, those things. No, you might I, as well. yeah, that's what he was. He was looking for a Marsoc. That's yeah. what he was looking. You for. might as well find it. So tell them what. Um, so SOTG was Special Operations Training Group. And SOTG, um, they would go through this package and they would do this, this whole package as though it was full mission profile stuff. And then it would end with a true, which was tactical readiness, urban environment. And they were literally doing building takedowns with helicopters and explosives right downtown in the major cities. Uh, you would hear a gas leak or you would hear like all kinds of silly shit. Yeah. Uh, SWAT action where you need to cordon this block off. And you and a lot of times it was military operations. And that's probably what you're seeing right now. When you see major cities and all these Blackhawks land, it's training like that. Yeah, it's 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 Delta Force or Green Berets training to the old MUSOC standard. The Marine Corps, so when we're talking about uh, urban environment fighting modern urban fighting. So the MUSOC program, when we were going into, you know, downtown LA, we were ripping and roaring in downtown LA. When we were going into San Francisco and doing that stuff. That's German chocolate cake. Oh. With like some German but it's not cherry on top. It's like a, it's a egg McMuffin. Well, he made. Oh, he, your, your guy made those? Yes. Oh, that's pretty cool. How yeah. old is he? Like 100? How old is he? Yeah. Yeah, because only, only only old, old people, people and funerals have jo- yeah. German chocolate it's, cake. It's, it's, it's funeral cake. <laughs> it is. It's 100%. Dude, I got... She, Stella was so fucking angry about that for months, and I didn't know. I didn't know what her problem was. She had bought me that German chocolate cake, and then you guys were joking about it, but I'd bought three of the fucking cakes before that myself, and, like... <laughs> have a lot like she was mad at the red sweater you know it's fucking just nuts yeah uh, i mean well, john loves german chocolate cake so if you're having a funeral <laughs> he might be there i don't even know what's on the top of that it's it's a uh, coconut pecan frosting i think it's pecan or coconut walnut 
with some alcohol infused black cherry. All old people stuff. If you take <laughs> Fuck no. coconut, old. Yeah. I mean, Walnuts, you've that's lost what your my mind. Have. Yeah. So, what is a young pro- I, Just because I don't need sprinkles. I was about to say sprinkles, <laughs> vanilla. Yeah. Cream Would you cheese? get a sprinkle donut? All day. Bullshit. Yeah. Did you have a donut today? No. I wouldn't mind having a sprinkle. Is a donut. is a donut? Just a question for you: is it is a donut a treat, or when you're searching the gas station for some sort group. of substance? <laughs> It's a, it's, it's, you would just, you, would you just go to a donut yeah. as a go-to yeah. in and place of meat? <laughs> How old are you? Well, what you do is you buy those chicken rollers and you cut them. What is a chicken food. roller? Like, you know, like a it's t- that thing at the, it's that thing that's on the roller that cooks okay. for like four days. Oh, I thought days, you were talking about a tool. No. Four days before anybody buys it. I said, I, what I was talking, I, four, at 4 a.m. I sent him, I'm like, yo, what's up at 4 a.m. He got back at like five. I'm like, what have you eaten today? He's like, nothing. I'm going to stop at the gas station. I go, what are you going to fucking eat there? What did you say? Uh, I can't remember. Probably pizza. I said, make sure it's four days old, whatever you get. Well, if it's been cooking for four days, there's no bacteria. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's good. It's it's scrumptious. Perfect. Perfect. It's scrumptious. Except for everything that's falling... Everything that's falling from the sky and landing on those rollers and just getting smashed into your... And all the kids with snotty noses. Touching them and then putting them back. <laughs> Put that back. That's what makes the flavor so good. Uh-huh. I mean, that it is. And then I, oh, I always run it under those self chili and cheese things. So I put the chicken roller yeah. on my hot dog bun. And then I always know that there's going to be a crust on the chili and cheese. So I take a napkin, put it under there, get the crust off both of them, throw that away... Go back, line the chili and cheese. I'm good. What's that weigh? A pound? Two. Two pounds? Man, that's 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 crazy. Because the chili, because the chili time. and cheese is free. Yeah. It's a condiment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So back to uh, uh, true tactical ready and serving true. environment. True. Yeah. Um, full mission profiles. You know, the Marine Corps was doing the Marine Corps. Basically, sometime in the early '90s, uh, Delta actually came out here and was like, hey, this shit is badass. We want in. And so they started doing true exercises. Uh, I think their first one was, it was either in Texas or it was like Louisiana or something. They started doing them too. And that's when people, the interesting thing is, the Marine Corps had been doing that for, we've been doing it for 15 years at least in major metropolitan cities. I'm not talking about out in the country. We were in San Francisco doing this shit. We were in Los Angeles, uh, Stockton, California. Um, we were doing real hits in real towns. And nobody really said anything about it. And then the first time Delta did a hit down south somewhere, it was like their first big mission profile one. Everybody's like, what the fuck's going on? Black helicopters. The government's trying to the government's trying to kill everybody in the cities. Why are these army guys here it was it was weird that the that they got all the they got they took all the heat for what we were actually doing so before we took a break you were starting to say that i i said that when you see these black helicopters it's it's really training profiles and you were starting to say that it's either delta or sf it's green beret guys yeah it's it's going to be uh when you see those when you see black helicopters it's going to be delta or it's going to be well it'll be I'm, i'm sorry delta does not fly helicopters it'll be the it'll be their arm of 160. Uh, yeah, it'll be the 160th guys out doing mission profiles. Um, they had they had fucking like ten of them in Nashville a couple of years ago. Yeah, they're t- any any place that they can any place that they can run profiles, they'll do it. Like uh, uh, even uh, the Marine Corps is doing is started doing, and I don't know why. Maybe it's because of the rivers, but the Marine Corps is starting to do uh, uh, recon training in. Do you think Nashville. that's to, for, to familiarize their? They're pilots, or you think that's so that when civil unrest comes, they're going to yeah, familiarize pilots. I mean, the military, the, the military planners know the truth that most uh, conspiracy theory guys don't know, and the military planners know that if the if the United States went in up and if the United States went into some sort of civil war. If it wasn't localized, like if it, let's say, I don't know, let's say Tennessee was like, fuck it, we don't want to be in the union anymore, fuck you. Maybe, maybe the Department of Defense could do something about that. But if the entire country segregates itself through some sort of civil unrest, there's not enough troops. They don't have enough troops. The only thing they could possibly do is fortify some major metropolitans, like they couldn't do Los Angeles. 
uh, they would probably fortify Washington, D.C. and uh, a bunch of places in the Dakotas. A bunch of places in the Dakotas would get tons of tanks and uh, and army personnel because that's where all the that's where all the nuclear weapons are. Um, maybe a small portion of LA County, but the reality is, if if they took every active duty soldier and every reservist, they wouldn't be able to control half the cities in America. So everybody else would be, it would be the wild wild west everywhere else. So and then and that's. And that's saying that, you know, the reality is that's saying that would the Texas, if Texas seceded, would the Texas National Guard show up for the federal government or would they stay in Texas? Right. They'd stay in Texas. The first thing you do, the first thing you do in that type of environment is confiscate all the equipment that's within your borders. So, you know, sorry, Air Force, if, if the Dakotas decide to secede from the United States, you're going to have to fight your way in there to get your to get your nuclear weapons because the first thing they're going to do is surround those things and say, these are our nuclear weapons. Uh, it's just, you know, we don't have enough. There's, there's not a, no, there's not a realistic amount of manpower to uh, get involved in something like that. And the problem with this, the problem with the type of civil war, when we're talking red versus blue, everything's commingled. Now. Everything's commingled. It's not like the, it's not like, you know, the old days where you just be like, Oh, go South. That's where the bad guys are. Or the, <laughs> And it won't be like that. It'll be have your you next door the, neighbor. Have you seen the blue and red maps? Yeah. And and you have this this idea that there are so there's just these these liberals everywhere. But when you look at the map of how they vote, there's just pockets. It's it's mm. they're they're very small islands. They're small islands, but it's it's population based. And so that's why places like Los Angeles County. Los Angeles County and San Francisco are probably the two bluest places in California. If you look at most of the state every, you know, 90% of the state of California is actually red. But because of voters, L.A. County has more, you know, L.A. County has more voters than San Bernardino County. So, you know, San Bernardino can be as red as it wants. L.A. is going to decide the laws and... Yeah, but they're not about that. Like, like those guys... Voting, no, I know. Those guys voting that way, they are not, like... They're they're, well, they're, I, they're those fair weather fans, man. Yeah, as soon I, as, I feel like I feel like that there's a uh, let let MS13 run through there for two weeks and yeah. see how they feel. I feel like there's a very there's a there's it is a larger population of individuals that that voted Democrat that are now seeing the truth about what the Democratic Party is all about. And I mean, like take Martha's Vineyard. It's the most. It's one of the most Democratic millionaire places you can go they had those mexicans out of there in 24 hours they even called the army and said hey you need to come get these motherfuckers they can't stay in martha's vineyard i mean so the, the democratic party is the, it, it guys i know you've been lied to and i know you think you're right but the democratic party never took off their clan hoods never they just put them in the closet everybody thinks that they're they everybody thinks they're not the clan they are the clan. Just look, take a look at every single policy that they push forward. This is a clan. They're just, anyways. I don't want to harp on you, poor Democrats, because you're going to lose the next civil war. They're probably not listening to this. <laughs> now, there's there's two that are like, I know those motherfuckers are going to talk about us. I'm going to listen to this shit. Send it. Send all the send all the notes to Nancy. Um, but yeah, they, it's just, you know, it's it's terrible that a that most people don't know this is Republic, not a democracy. Uh, I know that the, again, the democratic party likes to say you're a democratic vote, but this is a Republican, not a democracy and be thankful every day. Even if you're a Democrat, be thankful. It's a Republican. It's a Republic, not a democracy because a Republic stands up for your individual rights. A democracy tramples your individual rights. If, if 10 people want your bicycle in a democracy, they get your bicycle in a Republic. They don't get your bicycle. So be thankful that we are a Republican, not a democracy. I know you want to push your agendas and you think, oh, universal health care would be so much better. No, it won't. It's not. Do your, re do your due diligence. Universal health care in Canada is shit. They come here. Yeah, they come here. The because if you, if, you need here. A, if you need a heart transplant, you ain't getting it. You come here, you're going to get it. Go to China. Or you can go to China and get uh, 
eight get of them. a Uyghur. You get eight a Uyghur hearts. heart. They guarantee eight organs, just in case your body rejects them. So, anyways, I, I don't want to. So back to true. Back to tell true. them, tell them basic in in blocks from the overview. What is what does a true look like? Like from from let's say okay, you get your platoon, and you're gonna you're gonna go through this. SOTG package. How if you're going through the SOT package, what you're going to do is you're going to go through. Uh, you're going to go. You're going to start with uh, your CQB training. That'll be that was all at range 130 at the time. You go to range 130 and you would spend. Uh, it's been so long. I think it's. I think. I think the Force Recon Platoon is doing five weeks, on on uh, on the bays at range 130. So they're shooting the bays and then they're also doing. Um, they're also doing full mission profile hits on the two shoot houses that they had out there. At the same time, there's an applied explosive class going on that's using the minimal using the minimal amount of explosives to do the maximum amount of damage. And also at the same time, the uh, MSPF sniper course is going on. That was four weeks, I think. That stands for yeah. Maritime Special Purpose yeah, Forces. Mar- Mar- Maritime Special Purpose Forces. So that you would. You would have to go through those. You would have to go through those classes, and you would have to get certified. It wasn't like most places where if you if you finish the if you finish the program, you get a little piece of paper, and you're like, "Hey, you're a NASCAR driver." No, you had to. You actually had to get certified in doing it, and sometimes people didn't get cert. Um, so you would do that. Seals would come up. We'd have a, a portion which was called interoperability, where the seals would come up because we uh, the seals were part of the MUSOC program. Even though they weren't under the MUSOC command, they still came up to range one thirty, did training with the force recon platoon as far as uh, CQB and that stuff. They they ran their mission profiles and stuff, uh, and then you would go to true training. I think. Yeah, true training. After that, and they at true training they would do a the force recon guys would do a go plat takedown. That's so a they would gas oil platform. Gas oil platform off the same off the off San, Ber- San Santa Barbara. Santa Barbara. Sorry, off Santa Barbara. Those were shells or yeah, shell or something terrible. I hated the I hated the go plat when we had to go out to the go plats. I hated it. Well, the Marines would stay on the go plat. Yeah, the SEALs would go into the nightclubs every fucking yeah, night. Yeah, they because they they have. Better boats than we do. <laughs> Reality is the seals have better boats than we do. Um, so they would do basically they would do a go plat takedown. Uh, the snipers would support it, support that through a Huey helicopter, um, and then they would do they would do the go plats, and then we would go do a full we do full mission profile CQB. In a town, so whether that was New York, whether that was uh, San Francisco, L.A., S- Stockton, or wherever we could get San Diego, quite a bit. San Diego too. Those were usually uh, in San Diego. It was usually uh, it wasn't part of the the evaluation. That would be just the training. A lot of VIP. They had a whole VIP VIP section, section and all that. So basically, shipping. you're you're looking for a uh, you're looking for a building in a downtown metropolitan area that is no longer being used. They're all over the place, really. And then what would happen is RNS would go. RNS would get a. We basically get a warning order where they'd be like, "Hey, you know, terrorists have taken the Nakatoma building, and we need to go check it out." And so the the um, the sniper section would go in and do the reconnaissance for the CQB section. And uh, basically, they had this. We had this at the time. It was like this dot matrix thing where we could pass information over the radio through numbers and letters and the guys on the other side could actually draw the building. This is before all the high speed shit we have now. Um, and they could draw the building and then the force recon guys could get a kind of an idea of what the structure was and what they were going to need to take down that target. <coughs> and then these dudes would, they'd, they'd be like one of them was they'd be in a park across the way from a, um, it was an abandoned, YMCA, one of them was a YMCA building, one was a library, or they, the snipers were in the bell tower at the library across yeah. the way. Oh, I mean, it, it just depend, it depends. It depends on what the we, hinges are on, when the daylights come mm-hmm. on, when the joggers come, what time the mail's delivered, and they give all that information over. It just depended on uh, the target location, and uh, and so the then the force recon guys would prep up and do a they do a full mission profile. Now, when I say full mission profile, this is all live rounds. So we're in downtown Los Angeles, uh, 
and they're going to come in in helicopters, fast rope onto the target, or sometimes, you know, they would take rider vans in and jump out of the rider vans and be all ninja. I saw them do both at the same thing. Yeah, sometimes explos- they'll, explosives on sometime the they'll do that. It's all explosive entry. Uh, you know, they, they had the Broco torches at that time, too, yep. where they would sometimes they would just <laughs> cut a hole in the wall and, and go in through the hole in the wall. And then, uh, and, uh, and the snipers, uh, so there'd always be a countdown on the breach, and the snipers would shoot when they breached the door. So if we had, uh, if there was like exterior guards, that's what the snipers would identify, and they'd have to shoot those exterior guards. And that was all live fire. Um, and then after that, they would do a VBSS. They would do a, a boat. They would take down a, a boat. Um, and then you were basically done. They, they would evaluate and, you know, score everything. And then the Mu commander would be like, are we certified? Are we certified? Because the, the, uh, the threat was, if you didn't certify, if you didn't pass all those things, you'd have to do it over. Um, I think it only happened once where they did a do over. Um, but the, it was, it was pretty high stress. I mean, I, I've seen some force, I've seen some force recon guys and instructors almost go to blows over critiques of their mission. I mean, before Booker took over, he was in the audience. I mean, we were doing a mission. We were doing a, uh, a mission in, it was in San Francisco, I think. And the instructor, Bobby McCrate. That's right, Bobby. I'm talking about you. Where is Bobby McCrate? Uh, I, you know, I don't know. Last I heard he was working for a thermal company, but he might be doing something. You know, he's always got his fingers in somebody's pie. Um, basically, they, the RNS staff at that time put our sniper section in an unwinnable situation and then tried to critique us on the unwinnable situation. And <laughs> I thought Chris was going to kick Bobby's ass, but then, then uh, Booker was like, Hey, 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 I got my notes here. You need to calm down. <laughs> and he hadn't even taken over the section yet. So it was, it was, it was, I will tell you this, that MSPF training was the best training I had ever gotten in the Marine Corps, and that's the full 20 years. It, n- nothing's ever touched it because it was all really full mission profile, and they would drop you off in down, you know, you'd be in civilian clothes, but you'd still have, you'd have like, I'd have my M40. There was this, all this crazy camera gear we used to have to carry around. All the big ass, old, this is the old days, so all the radios were, just, were fucking huge, and we'd have to, we'd have to carry all this stuff. So if a police car drove by us, they would just be like, Oh, looks like somebody's moving. <laughs> you know, it, it had to be, you couldn't get rolled up by the police. You couldn't have civilians calling that, hey, I just saw somebody go in this building with a gun. You couldn't do any of that shit. So it was all full mission profile and you really had to hide from everybody. And I mean, we did some crazy, we did some crazy shit that if the commandant, of the, if the commandant of the Marine Corps ever would have went out on one of, like went with the RNS element, he'd have been like, Oh hell no! We're shutting this shit down. <laughs> There's no way these guys are doing the things they're doing. And it was, but it was, it was all very applicable to the real world. So give me some examples. Um, you know, you would have, you would get like, one time we got locked into a, uh, we got locked into. It was some sort of um, industrial complex. So you had this warehouse that was probably, you know. I bet it was 60 by 200 and it was just full of milling machines. It was two stories. So it was 20 feet, 20 feet to the roof and they McCrate again. They locked us in here. It had 20 foot fences all around it and um, Bob wire at the top of the fence. And so they locked us in here and they're like, you guys will figure it out. <laughs> so we're like, fuck, but you know, we, we go to the end of the fences where we can't, we can't get out. We can't get out. There's no way to get out of this without cutting the fence and you know, they tell you, you can't destroy property or anything. Cause you know, we're, it's a real business. Like in the, when the sun comes up, cars yeah, are going to pull in the park. They don't know. Yeah, you're yeah, there. They don't know you're there. Cars are going to pull up and all that shit. And so it's a real business. You can't do any damage. So Chris, I think it was Chris or it was, it might've been Travis figured out a way to get in the building. Like we climbed through a window and got inside the building. So we're thinking we'll get in the building and we'll just go through the building to get to where we need to go. 
Well, we get in the building and we're creeping around. There's, you know, it's all heavy machinery and there's a, there's a TV on in there. And so we creep over to where the TV is and this guy has got his family living in, there's like a side room and he's got his family. And so we're like, shit, we can't, we can't let, we can't, cause the way we had to go was past them. So again, I think Hayes found a ladder that went to the roof. And so now we're on this roof and we're walking across this roof. Now we've got duffel bags of gear. That's huge. I mean, it's radios and fucking batteries and all this bullshit. Hundreds and, of pounds. Yeah, so everybody's carrying everybody's carrying a bag that was never made. It was never made to carry any of this equipment. And by the way, the Marine Corps didn't provide us with any of that stuff. You had to go out and buy it yourself. And so we're crossing this roof, and I see, I see this green fiberglass bullshit <laughs> at, on the on the roof, and I'm like, okay. That's how they get light in there. Don't step here. So I look at Chris. I mean, I look at Travis and I go, Travis, don't step on that shit because that's just thin fiberglass. You'll go right to the fucking, you'll go right into the room. Probably, I don't know. We don't go, we don't go 10 more feet. And I hear a muffled scream for help (laughs) and boom, boom, boom. And I see the bag that all our radio gear was in. Boom, boom, off the side of the building, down to the ground. I turn around and Schmidt, (laughs) Schmidt is up to his armpits in this fiberglass. Travis had not said, don't step on the fiberglass. And, you know, he was carrying the bag on his shoulder and shit, so he probably didn't even see it. So he's up to his armpits. Now it's 20 feet down to you know, a CNC machine and not, not the cool ones today where they're all encapsulated. I'm talking about the ones that are just milling machines, milling machines. And, and there's shit. three people inside. And there's three people in there. So we rescue, we rescue Schmidt out of that. And then, uh, we have to figure out a way to get down to get the bag and shit. And you're, you're everything's dark. So you got these little teeny flashlights and this is the nineties. So the flashlights, what, what are they like? Three lumens, like holding a candle up to, we're trying to make sure that nothing was broken. I think the only thing we lost was a camera, uh, that the camera was damaged. And then we have to go, you know, we we're able to get to the site that we're supposed to set up our RNS post and we set up our RNS posts and all that. But, um, I mean, there was some dangerous shit. And then, you know, we had an FBI agent that was supposed to do local, law enforcement like he would tell local law enforcement hey we're going to be here this is what they're going to be doing blah 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 but a couple you know there was a couple of times where like it didn't funnel down to the guy who's actually at the donut shop (laughs) it didn't funnel down to the actual street cops and you know dudes in civilian clothes with fucking m16s and shit (laughs) tend to be a problem uh so it, it 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 got dangerous we've had we had drawdowns sometimes there was a target in uh there was a target in los angeles where we ha- we have actors because obviously there are there are snipers looking at the target so they have actors with plastic ak-47s and that are walking around the the crisis site right and the the actors will do things so that we have things to report on so like one time dude runs out of the door in his underwear and goes running down the street and three dudes with AKs chase him down and drag him back in the building. Well, that, that was for us to be able to send back to the, back to the ship. And so they'd be like, Oh God, shit's getting real. We might have to take this place down. Right. Some other people saw it. Yeah. So some other people saw it. So their force recon is, uh, it was actually pretty interesting. Force recon's getting ready to do their raid. And I think this was a, this was a U-Haul. They were all in U-Haul trucks and, (laughs) And this, remember, the snipers are in Overwatch positions, so they're looking at the target. And uh, it was it was uh, Sarnice at the time. Sarnice is like, I got you, I I got you in my sights. Uh, you know, I can't remember what they, I can't remember what their code word was. You know, Bluebird is in the last covered and concealed, and the Force Recon guys are like, um, we're still in the trucks. He's like, um. You're not in the trucks. I can see you right below me. You're all stacked up, ready to go. <laughs> and, and they're like, we're still in the trucks. That's not us. I don't think that's us. 
and somebody had called somebody had saw the actors running around with their plastic AKs and called the local police department and the SWAT team was stacked up ready to go like they were they were getting ready to breach that door and go in there and shoot everybody with a gun and in, and fortunately Issa saw them stacked up and was able to get you know get Mike Roof on the phone and be like hey man you got cops down here they're getting ready to blow this whole thing and so Mike Roof is running around hey holy shit FBI special agent you know we're just training <laughs> and he, he calmed it all down but I mean it, it got close I we had a I mean I even had an RS RNS team I had an RNS team where the RNS uh, lead, the team leader was like, if we get compromised, we're just going to guns. If we get compromised, fuck all this sneaking around. We're just going to guns and going back to our recovery point. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> here we are in downtown Stockton. With live bullets. Yeah, they, everybody had live rounds. I'm like, here we are in downtown Stockton. You guys are not going to make it a mile if you... If you throw your rucks on, you get rid of all your get rid of all your bags that you're hiding all your stuff in, and throw rucks on, and get your ARs out or your M16s out, and just patrol to the. But that actually happened, didn't it? Yeah. Well, they there was a there was a bit of an argument, and then Booker was like, "Let them do it. Fuck it. Let's see if they want to do it. Let them do it." Man, they didn't even get off the they didn't even get off the base. They got to the railroad tracks, and and a cop was like, "Woo woo woo woo! What's going on over here?" And this guy did not know this guy, this again, because sometimes it doesn't make it to the lower le- echelon. He did not know that there was training going on. Now he didn't again, cause this was the nineties. People weren't as sorry, law enforcement gun, gun, uh, ho. gung ho with pulling their pistols. He didn't, he didn't draw down on them and there wasn't a gunfight cause it would have been bad if there had been a gunfight. Um, but he did lock the team leader in the back of the squad car. Like did lock just, uh, you know, Hey, for your safety, I'm putting you in the back of the car until we figure out what the fuck is going on. And so again, Mike Rowe had to come out with his little FBI badge and be like, Hey man, you know, we're just we're doing some training. These guys thought they could sneak through your town all GI Joe'd out. He's like, they had M 16s. What was I supposed to do? I had to stop and see what the fuck was going on. So, uh, I mean, it, it, it was, it was dangerous training and ultimately the Marine Corps killed it because I don't know which commandant, it was, but he was like, there's no way we'll ever be able to explain a CH-46 crashing in downtown LA. If a CH-46 goes down, that was his big worry is the aircraft. If an aircraft went down, there's no way we could explain it. Now, I don't believe we ever, I don't believe SOTG ever had even a close call when it comes to that kind of thing. Now we did lose, we did lose a bunch of we did lose a bunch of force recon Marines and some SOTG instructors when a, when they were doing a, uh, a VBSS, the, the helicopters landing gear got caught in, uh, some arresting gear on the, on the ship flipped into the water and they lost a bunch of guys. Um, but that was out in the ocean. That was a military ship. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't civilian. It wasn't in town. I don't think we ever had an in town incident, but that that's what got it killed. And then they, they started the program up again, uh, like five years later, but basically all the, all the oomph and all the, all the things that made SOTG what it was had been lost because well, of debt right one around. and all that other and shit. That, that was also, yeah. So MCM, shallow water mine countermeasures yeah. or whatever Gosney's um, stood that up. But that was also about the same time when they were giving people hassle about their ammo. They were given like, okay, 50 cal ba- Sasser guys like Barrett's are going to use these air compressed. So it was the mm-hmm. kinder, gentler Marine Corps shit was changing rapidly. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it, it definitely like the, they start. They restarted up the RNS package and the sniper package, but they they weren't allowed to do any more mi- any more full mission profiles off base. And th- I mean, so it it kind of it kind of neutered it. That's the that's the problem with a lot of uh, that's a lot of that's a problem with a lot of the training. Once you once you make the training big enough where people recognize the value of it, they want everybody to be able to do it. And the truth of the matter is, it's a fucking lie. Every Marine is not a rifleman. Like every Marine's not a rifleman. Every Marine can't be a force recon Marine. Every soldier can't be a green beret. It's a lie. 
do any Marine Corps um, riflemen have breasts? No, no. Oh, yeah. I think now. I think now there's there's some riflemen with breasts. Uh, by the way, do they have penises or are they actually women? No, they don't have penises. I mean, I don't. I don't think we've gone that far yet. But by the way, um, you gonna tell me the seal is detransitioning? Uh, yeah, win for you. This is the seal's detransitioning. Going how's back. That a win, how's that a win for well, me? Well, I know you're. You, you know, I'm a. I'm a 1911 fanboy. You're kind of a seal fanboy. So I mean, bringing him back in the fold. <laughs> I'm a seal fanboy. Bringing him back in the fold. That's pretty good. That he's like detransitioning and totally blaming the fucking Department of Defense I, for I his think, transition. I think Travis Haley has the best hair. Isn't he a seal? No, he's no, not. No, he's, Travis I'm fucking not with seal. you. No, he's not. He's I know not a seal. he's not. Travis not Did a seal. you hear Wait a Tra- minute. Is, is can you tell me this? Is Travis Haley uh the Balakava contractor? Is he the Balakava guy? Is yeah. that Travis Haley? He was there. Yeah. Uh, uh, interesting. He, he was there with Ben with yeah. Mookie. Um somebody tell Travis I said that. Did you hear Travis on uh, Grand Thumb? I did not. I'll send you it's worth listening to. It's a it's a good good podcast and he did all the, i mean travis did all that you know that's that's really where the the bulk of his uh like initial training came from was all that SOTG, CTB, yeah, yeah foundation stuff yeah. i mean they did a good I, they did a good job like the instructor the instructors that were out there teaching they were bigger than life like i had just gotten back from mogadishu when i went to sotg and when I got, when I got, I had just got back from Mogadishu and when I got there, uh, Booker was not there yet. He was out doing something. He was on a true mission or something. And I got there, I show up to range 130, and there's all these old force recon guys, like in the, in the, in the day I say old, they were probably all in their thirties or 25 maybe, but they were old, you know, they were salty. They were all fucking gunnies and they hadn't been to Vietnam, none of them, none of them been to Vietnam, Vietnam but they were, they were, uh. They don't, they were all, you know, they were all larger than life guys. And I got there and, uh, and the first thing that the, the gunny that was in charge of range one thirty, he's like, uh, here's a, here's a swing rake. Go out there and cut down all those, <laughs> cut down all those weeds out front of the gate. Don't and we so, have prisoners for that? <laughs> yeah. I'm out there with a fucking swing rake cutting weeds and Booker pulls up and loses his shit. He's like, what the fuck are you doing? I go. Uh, you told me to come to range 130. I came to range 130. Gunny told me to cut the <laughs> cut the weeds, and so he's like, so Booker drags me. It was it was pretty cool. Booker drags me over there and just chews their asses about you know. At the time, I was the only one with a combat action ribbon, right? And he's like, you got the you got the only you got the only guy who's actually seen some shit on this entire range 130 cutting weeds. I mean, he, he lost his shit about it, but I mean, it was, again, I was young when I, when, when I, I was 20, maybe 22 when I got to SOTG, you know, so I was young and the, and again, these force recon guys, they, they looked the look like they looked the look, they looked exactly how you thought they should look like action figures. Yeah. They looked exactly, they were all fucking they were all some of them actually we got some of them actually yeah some of them actually figures. became action figures they looked to look you know I, my uh my cqb instructor for uh pistol was sebastianski who where's he now he unfortunately died on that helicopter. helicopter yeah he unfortunately died on the helicopter and he was you know the funny thing about him he was like and don't take this wrong he was a granola eating a mountain climbing like he was yeah, the hippie walking around barefoot he was the hippiest of hippie Got, but man, he knew his fucking job. Like he knew his job, and I to this day, I, you know, I'll tell you this. He's the only reason why. He's the only reason why I passed the pistol portion of CQB, because he paid attention to what I was doing, and I wasn't at that time. I mean, you know, people think that the military shoots a bunch of ammo, but I think I probably shot thirty rounds through a pistol at that time. And, you know, Beretta. So he's watching me shoot, and he's like, the target is too fucking big. I know exactly what you're doing wrong. The target's too big. Come over to the come over to the dam. We went over to another bay, and he just put up the pepper popper, you know, the plates, the plate rack. And he's like, just stay here and shoot the plate rack. And so I'm like, boom, shooting the plate rack. And I guess, you know, it's one of those things that just clicks in your head. And then you go over. Because when you're shooting, when you're when you're qualifying, you're qualifying on a full uh 
I think they're B mod targets, you know, the, just the, the cardboard, the heavy cardboard green targets. And they make a circle in the center and a square box in the head. You can't, when you're qualifying, you can't see the circle or the square box. And so that was my problem. I was, I was aiming at the silhouette and not the circle. And so he, I mean, he immediately saw it and was like, come here, we're going to fix this shit. <laughs> But, I mean, he was a fucking great guy. Like I said, those guys, those Force Recon guys, they put in the hours. They fucking, they they lived up to their reputation. I, I, I There wasn't ever a time where I was like, man, these guys ain't shit. Uh, and I was there for five years, I think. You know, I, I, I actually got to stay there a little bit longer than most. I think Travis beat me out, though. I think he got six years there, that son of a bitch. But, um, yeah, they were, they were, they were bigger than life, man. Do you, um... You think we could get Travis out here? He comes out to, he comes out. I mean, I don't know if he would do a podcast, but he comes out to Clarksville because of the SF guys out there and he's doing, why would he doing not, some stuff. Why would he not do a podcast? Well, I don't know if he wants to. Is he doing secret shit? No, he's not doing secret shit anymore. Is he still with the same company? No, uh-uh, he's with a different company. Got it. Um, so Mogadishu, from Black, when were you there as in compared we were to Black Hawk Down? Three days after Black Hawk Down. Was there still shit going on? No, it was all locked up. It was all, it was all, it was all, well, I mean, it was a, you have to understand the, the climate and the place they were, that when that happened, it was a block party for the, the, uh, the people of Mogadishu. Like they, they caught it. They, they, Hey, Oh, Hey, we have this opportunity to do this, all this harm to these Americans. Let's do it. They partied it up and then they just went home and they knew that they couldn't like, if you're a, if you're a guerrilla force, you know when you can do something, and then you know when you can't. And the day after Black Hawk Down was no time to be, you know, flexing because Delta, the Rangers that were still there, and uh, sorry, oh, Tenth Mountain, they would have fucking, I mean, they're ready. It's when you know, Everybody whenever present. we have, whenever we have a problem, it's because we're not ready for the problem. Um, but after the problem, we're really good at eliminating that threat. And so, you know, they had been doing, you know, the reality is those guys, the Delta guys that were there and the, the Rangers, they had been doing raid after raid after raid. This was not like they did a raid and got fucked up. I mean, they did 10 raids before that. I mean, they were, you know, they were on point and it just, they, the Somalis just got, I don't want to say lucky because there was a little bit of complacency in our, we got unlucky. We got unlucky. Uh, and they, and they were quick to react to that. The Somalis were very quick as a, as a, as a town, they were very quick to react to that. Meaning the roadblocks being put out and all that, they were very quick to react to that. Where most places aren't aren't as quick. Um, so, by the time we got there, they were you know the the Norwegians were still partying. So, you had a you had a brief that you used to give during sniper school, and it was considerably different from what was public facing. Is is all of that out public now, or is there still bits and pieces missing? I, from I'm a hundred percent. I'm. I believe that it's all public facing now. I think the only thing, um, I think the only thing that is not, like I think you can get pieces, but you can't get start to finish. So, um, all the, even back then, not as not as high tech, not as good but they tried to film all the raids that those guys were going on. You know, like the Delta guys probably should, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, you'll figure it out. The Delta guys now, they have fucking cameras on their helmets and shit. And, you know, Obama's sitting in the, they're yeah. watching it live. Well, yeah, they're, we, you know, they're watching it live. So all those raids are actually recorded. Um, and I know that they've released some of the footage of the birds going down, but I don't know if the whole block has been released. I don't know if they've just were like, I mean, it may have, I, I don't, I don't pay attention to that. I probably don't pay enough attention to that stuff anymore, but that whole block may have already been released. So they had aircraft specifically tasked with videotaping the raids. Why were we there to begin with? The real reason. Well, the real reason is because the UN is an ineffectual, is ineffectual as a they can't do anything with organization. The they can't, muscle. they can't do anything they're not they're, they don't have the capability to really flex muscle um without american firepower they can't really do shit and so the un went there because there was uh there was starvation going on in the 
in the outskirts. Now, you have to understand, Mogadishu was a major metropolitan uh, city that they basically kind of, that the Somalis basically kind of destroyed. Um, but outside of Mogadishu, there were actually people out there that were starving to death. And so the UN was like, hey, I got a great idea. Let's go to Mogadishu and we'll make sure these people don't starve to death. Well, the problem for the UN is Mogadishu was run by several warlord factions and the, the UN wasn't really keen to be like, Hey, we're just going to, we'll give you a deed, all this money and you take the food out there. Well, they were doing that, but a deed and the other warlords were stealing more food that the UN could, uh, that the UN could actually ship in. And because, and they were using, basically they were using food I don't want to say it's currency, but basically you were either, if you were loyal to a deed, then you got fed. The people out, the people that lived out in the bush, a deed didn't give two shits about, you know, the warlords didn't care. They just cared about how much firepower they could bring to bear inside Mogadishu. Isn't that how it always is? I mean, we do. It is always that way. We do these huge food drives and we, we fill these ships with food and then the food rots on the ships in harbor. Oh yeah. The, that, uh, the first, the, that first, we are the world. Do you remember we That's are the world exactly when they did all that? That's what I'm talking about. We are the world. Uh, go Apple, ahead and... High hands across America yeah. and all that shit. Go ahead and see what happened. Uh, when when they did We Are the World, they bought uh, a container. They bought a huge ship worth of food that they were gonna that they sent to Africa because we're going to help the starving people of Africa. Uh, I don't know which government. It may actually have been Somalia when Somalia was stable. But I don't know which port they went into. It was either Somalia or Kenya. And the government was like, fuck you. That food can stay on this. They can stay right here and rot. So all the money that they raised and all the food that they put on those ships never went to a single starving person. And it was the same thing that was going on in Mogadishu, that the, the people on the outskirts that were starving, um, the food never made it out there because the, the warlords would just take it. And so what they did was, what <laughs> the crazy thing is, the because the UN is always trying to do something where they're like, where they're trying to distance themselves from firepower from really from America. Like we don't want social workers. Yeah. We don't don't want, we don't want America to get involved in this because you guys bring guns. And so people are still starving. They're not getting their food rations and the UN, you know, Boutros Ghali was the one who was in charge of time. They do like a survey where they're like, how come you don't have any food, John? We gave you 20 pounds of rice yesterday. Where the fuck is all your food? And you're like, Warlords come with guns and take food. And and so the UN starts scratching their chin and they're like, okay, okay, okay. All right. If the warlords are coming with guns and taking food, I got an idea. Let's give everybody guns. If we give everybody guns, then the warlords can't take... That's a great idea. Let's do that. Guns. And so, yeah, then the warlords just come and take all the guns. So... It was a, it, you know, it was a joke. It's like the, we, we were, we were paying $4. Somalis would come on the base and clean. And we were paying them $4 a day to clean. The UN was paying them $4 a day to clean. Adid got three of those dollars. When they walked off the base, there was, you know, Collecting. warlords would take, and get, they would get three of those dollars. Now, the Somalis that went on the base to work and got a dollar were happy because they got a fucking dollar. They have you're going to let me go do that. And all I have to do is give you these $3 that don't really matter. They were doing it. And there was, we stayed, they had a bunch of trailers on the, they had a bunch of trailers on the base. There was like uh, 20, 20 of these trailers that they had on the base that the UN was using through a shell corporation out of Kenya. A deed was actually renting <laughs> these buildings to the UN. They, when, before we left, there was a, a uh, was he, New Zealand. He was from New Zealand. He was a great guy. Guy, uh, he was a, a PA, was a um, public affairs officer from New Zealand, and we would we would have to talk to him all the time because anytime you shot an engagement, they would have to do a story or something like that. And he said he said that they they calculated, they went through the numbers, and the UN was actually paying a deed about a million dollars a month in order to stay there. And at this time, we were trying to kill him. <laughs> We were trying to kill him. So, did you have any any armed conflict? Uh, yeah, we 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 uh, we had seventeen we had seventeen engagements that ended in the death of a Somali. What did those look like? 
um, mostly. So at the time we were allowed to sh- at the time we were allowed to shoot anybody anybody that threatened a um so they they basically had four sniper posts in Mogadishu. So when we came ashore the SF guys were manning those sniper posts and the SF guys wanted to do coin out in the in the hinterlands and they didn't want to be on the sniper posts. What is coin? That's, you know, winning hearts and minds. They wanted to go out there and win hearts and minds. And so they didn't want anything to do with the sniper post. Of course, we're fucking marine snipers. Yeah, hell yeah, we want to. Well, we get these sniper posts, and as soon as they do the changeover, Boutros Ghali, the UN, they announce that there are marine snipers in these four places, and if they see these things, they're going to shoot you. <laughs> so, you know, the, the, the Somalis, you know, they're, they're people just like everyone else. They would. They would try and avoid being killed. Be, they would try and avoid our positions like the Black Plague. Um, but they now know where we're at. Um, if you've seen Black Hawk Down, the guy that the, the general is interviewing right at the beginning of the movie uh, was Otto. And Otto's garage, so his, his uh, base of operation was 350 yards right in front of mine and Chris's uh, post. And so there's bad guys going in there all the time. Now you have to understand everybody in Mo, everybody in the city of Mogadishu is armed. So you can't just shoot somebody who's armed. They have to pose a threat to you or they have to have a crew serve weapon, <coughs> RPG, you know, dishka, something, something big mortars. Belt fed. Not yet. Not yet. Um, so like Otto's garage, there was a guy every morning, he would get up. He would come out of the, he would come out of the gate like you. We could see into the compound because we were seven stories above him, and so he would come out the front door, have his AK slung. Like he was the only, you know, people carry their they carry those AKs however they want to carry them. They never sling them. This guy would sling his, and he would walk out. And initially there was no initially there was no con there was no there was no contact between us and him. Meaning there was no acknowledgement that he was doing what he was doing and he would come out of the house open the gate he would walk across the street to the hospital now the hospital had a 10 foot brick wall all the way around it he would walk across the street to the hospital and then like eh, you know, like three minutes later we would take about 10 ak rounds boom 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 somebody would shoot at the building they wouldn't hit anything and then you would see him, AK slung, and he would go. Well, he would do this every day, and it got to the point where he would come out of the house, he would look up at us, smile, and then he would walk across the street. He'd wave. We would wave back. Same thing. Three minutes later, boom, 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 he would shoot. Technically, it was outside of our ROEs, right? I, I know it's him doing it, but he's rifle slung. He's no threat to me. And they would be like, well, did you see him in the hospital? Like, no, he's firing from the other side of the wall. He's not, he, he literally never, I think we took, I, I take it back. The bunker got hit twice, but never, and that's out of, I don't know, probably 500 rounds he fired at us. <coughs> and the the Het guys were like, What's Het? Het is human intelligence, something, something. So it's, it's human now. Yeah, it's human. It's a, it's, it's a spies. And they were like, yeah. Uh, that's his job. He gets, I think it was a dollar or two dollars, some stupid. Every day he shoots at you guys. He gets paid for that, and that's his job. That's just what he does every is that day. To desensitize you guys, or what is the? Is there really any strategy behind <laughs> no, it? No, I think it would. I think in the sense of from from the Somalis, uh, from the Somalis perspective, is they were hoping they were going to hit somebody, but from a from an employee situation, from an employee situation. It's better if you don't hit anybody, right? It's better if you're an employee and you're getting a dollar a day to come shoot at the evil Americans. It's better if you don't hit us because you become a non-threat and then every day you come out and he like he's collecting a check. He's clocking in every day to come shoot at the evil Americans and it's like, just didn't hit him. I, I don't know, you know? So uh, we had an engagement at, you know, just to get back to the engagement stuff. Is, we that, had, is that guy still alive today? I doubt it. 
but you guys did. No, we didn't. We we never we never uh, we never engaged him, because again, according to the rules of engagement, once he slung that rifle, he was no longer a threat to us. Uh, If we would have saw, if he would have, if he would have stepped out far enough from the wall to where we could have seen him, we could have engaged him then. If you just smoked that fool nowadays, he'd be living in your house. Maybe. Fucking, they just bring him on over here, give him all your shit. Uh, and that was the, that was kind of the thing. We had a, a general Montgomery. I think it was general Montgomery. He was a three star. I believe he was in charge of all forces in, in Mogadishu. He came up and did a little piece. If you've seen the, there's a little history channel piece on Mogadishu. If you see a Marine sniper in chocolate chip, a uh, flak jacket on top of a bunker, that's me. I was hiding from him. <clears throat> Cause I didn't want to talk to the guy. I mean, you know, you just, you just don't want, it's not that I didn't want to talk to him. But he brought all his cronies, and they just wanted to. They're like, "Hey, look, we're on the sniper position." Best camo ever. Yeah, Top people. A lot of people were doing. A lot of people were doing that, coming to the sniper positions because we were the only ones at the time that were actually engaging uh, Somalis. And so he came up, and he's just like, "Tell us some stories." And so Chris is telling him, and then the guy's like, well, "Why didn't you shoot him?" I'm like, "Because uh, of your rules of engagement, we're not allowed to shoot him because of your rules." He's like. Yeah, but you could have shot that guy. We're like, uh, <laughs> that's not how your rules of engagement work, sir. So, I mean, we I, I will say that we were probably we were probably more disciplined up there than we needed to be. Like looking back on it, shit, imagine we, we could have the atmosphere we, today. We probably could have shot a lot more people than we did. But I will tell you that every every person that was taken out by our platoon was with was one hundred percent within the rules of engagement, except. And don't hate me. Except the guy, the first engagement that we had, which was me. He really wasn't in the rules of engagement, but he was. He was, but he wasn't. So Otto's Garage, again, we watch it all the time because that's that was supposed to be where the bad guys are at. This guy comes out of the house in an M60, in a camouflage M65 field jacket. This is, I mean, it, Mogadishu was actually beautiful. It wasn't, it wasn't like hot. It was 75. It was a beach town. It was, it was, it was a nice place. I can see why the French wanted to take it back. Um, comes out of his house. He's got an M65 field jacket on. He has a Rambo headband on and he has two belts of M60 ammunition wrapped around him. Now that is what keyed me in on him. Like he's got these two belts and I'm like, why has he got belts? What's your distance? It's 300 and... It was 330 yards. So you're looking at him through a spotting scope? Looking through him for the rifle. Rifle scope? The, the, the engagement area was so limited that you couldn't operate in the standard Marine Corps um, spotting scope shooter. Both of us were on the guns all the time. And if I saw a target, like I, if I saw a target on Afcoy Road, I'd be like, um, you know, cruise serve weapon, 500 yards, intersection. Boom, I would shoot. All I'm doing is telling Chris where to look and Chris would do the same thing. And then you would try and get track on target to see where this is going because it it just, the, the width of the roads were so narrow that you, if you, if I tried to tell Chris where to shoot, the guy would already be gone. So you had to, the whole time we, we never used the, I mean, when we were being lazy and just sitting up there kind of what's going on, we would use the M 49. But when you were, when you were on it, you were on the gun. Um, so this guy comes out and a pickup truck, red pickup truck, pull, a red Toyota Hilux pulls up right in front of the front of the house, comes out of the house. Um, he comes out. Now he's kind of behind the truck. A, a woman comes out, uh, two small children. I believe a, a, a girl who was really young, probably five. And then a boy who had to have been in the 10 or 11 range. Uh, they come out. He gives them the pats on the head. He's doing the high fives. I'm, I can only assume that this is his wife and kids. And he walks over to the truck. And when he walks over to the truck, he, he so he's on the other side of the truck. And I am actually looking through the windshield of the truck through the passenger windshield. I see him. He takes his hand and he goes, he pushes down like this. And when he pushes down like that, the stock of an M60 machine gun comes up. So it comes up, and now this M60 machine gun is right here. Who gave them M60 machine guns? I mean, it could have been from 
It could have been from the, the Black Hawk Down incident. It could, they could have got them from them, but probably just guns that we deposited in Africa, right? So he's got this M60 machine gun. <clears throat> so I, I yell at Chris. I'm like, hey, M60 machine gun? Boom, I shoot. The dude in the truck, the dude who's driving the truck, looks up at me. The dude with the M60 goes, like this. I'm like, what, what the fuck? <laughs> Line it up again. Shoot. Hit him right in the fucking throat. So you missed him the first time. I missed time. First, first time. Well, because <clears throat> we had not gone through SOTG training at the time. We're shooting at a high angle, and I'm shooting through two right, panes of right. glass. Right. I'm shooting through the front windshield and the passenger windshield. Glass deflection. Hit him in the, I hit him in the throat. He goes down. Um, and we're both on glass, right? truck speeds out and i'm like i'm on the gun and that the family runs inside the courtyard and that 10 year old boy runs out picks up the fucking gun grabs that m60 and starts dragging it now within a second he's out of he's just out he because i think he's running out I think he's running out to Pops. Like, he's going to, you know, hey, Pops, what's up? <coughs> he grabs that sling and, and turns to go into the compound. Three more seconds? I would have shot him. I mean. Do you think do you think they had pre had that discussion? Or do you think the kid was just going to get the gun? I, think, the, think, I was... think that Mogadishu was the way of the gun. That, that, that nothing matters but the gun you have. And I believe that that M60 was probably a... A prized possession, you know, it would have been a prized possession because most, you know, everybody had AKs, G3s, uh, you know, you name it. There was STG 44s there. They had they had guns, but I'm sure that that M60 was a prized possession. Now, I know what you're thinking. Was I within the rules of engagement? <laughs> well, according to the UN, I was not within the rules of engagement. So we get back. They break it. We break it all day because the, the Pakistanis are freaking out. We're in a, we're actually in a Pakistani compound. They're freaking out. We're like, what? Dude had an M60. We get back and we we're, we're talking to the PAO and he's like, um, you know, the rules is crew served weapons, uh, not M60 machine guns. I go, M60 machine gun is a crew served weapon. This he's is like a U.S. guy you're talking to. He's the, uh, um, New Zealander. Okay. He's a PA. I go, M60 is a crew served weapon. He's like, um, that's not really what they meant. They didn't mean it like that. They were talking about like mortar crews and RPGs and heavy Dishka machine guns. I go, I, I go, I, okay, now that you're, you're saying this to me, sir, maybe I see what you're talking about. I go, but an M60 machine gun is a crew served weapon in any service in the world. It's a it's a two man. I mean, even the saw is technically a crew served weapon. It's it's a two man operation. Somebody else is carrying the bipod or the tripod. And he's like, he's like, hmm. I bet I can sell this. I'll sell it. We'll be good. He's like, we'll be good. Don't worry about it. Uh, we'll just include we'll just include belt feds. If you if that if that happens again, I'm gonna say you're good to go. But let me just do some stuff. And so you know, a couple days later, he's like. You see any more belt feds? Go ahead. And Chris immediately goes, <laughs> he goes, you see any more belt feds? Go ahead. We'll, we'll call that cruiser weapon. And Chris immediately goes, well, what about an RPK? Now, for those of you who don't know, RPK is like a, it's like a big AK. It's like a big AK 75 round clip, or, you know, they have 75 round drums that they put in those things. And it's, it serves as the light machine gun. It used to serve as the light machine gun for a Russian squad, which in theory, you would say it would be the crew serve for that section. <laughs> and so he's like, he goes, man, I don't know if I can, because we would see those. You know, we'd see guys running around with those. He goes, I don't know if I could pull that off. He goes, what does it look like? I'm like, well, imagine a big AK, long barrel, big magazine. But it's the it's the full auto that they use for their squads. He's like, maybe not, maybe not RPKs. <laughs> maybe not RPKs. And I think Chris eventually did topple somebody with the 50 cal with an rpk but uh interesting you guys had 50s up there uh every post had an m82 yeah every post had a uh m82 ours had a 
a special forces one that had a fucking suppressor on it that was like 45 feet long. <laughs> How much time you got? Uh, I could, I really, we probably should cut it. I got to get back so somebody can go do something. All right, leave them with some hope. Hope. All is not lost. Everything is, I mean, have you been outside today? It's beautiful. It's about to be two degrees Shh. low and eight degrees Shh. high. Hope, in John, a couple hope. Days here. Everything's beautiful, wonderful. Are you, are you ready for the freeze? I think so. I think I'm ready for the freeze. When I walk outside and piss and my piss freezes, that's when I'm worried. Um, I do have a question for you, though. You know the you know the um, the the tote that we put up on the hill years ago? IBC tote. IBC tote. And we filled it with water? Yes. Did that, ever, did that ever freeze solid? Do you ever think it froze solid? So it probably freezes solid, but it's never damaged it. It's still there full of the original water. Cause I, well, because I, I got, no, I got three totes in strategic positions because of my, the, the. Uh, Paint them black, it'll help. The apple trees that I planted and stuff. Paint them black, that'll help. Um, if you bring them down to the ground, which it won't have as much pressure, but you can put straw around them, that'll also yeah, help. I'm not, I mean, I'm. I put stock tank heaters up there in those big stock tanks, and I won't. I'll have one that's got a skim of ice on top, and I'll just put the I, the heater on there, and in about five minutes, it's all melted, and I don't even run. I just rotate them back and right. forth, tank to tank to tank each day, and yeah, in my in my stock tanks, I have a heater in that there, water up there right now. It's got steam coming off of it, but uh, I don't I know have about to my pee apple orchard. super bad. But John's got a pee super bad, so hey, we're out. German chocolate, it's great for what uh, episode was this? Old folks' so, homes, or if you're if you have a death in the family, uh, get German chocolate. You can't leave or, yet. We got to record this thing real fast. What are we going to record? What are we going to record? Different real fast? episode. A different episode. How fast? Five minutes. Okay, five minutes. All right, five minutes. I'm not going to leave yet. I'm just going to sit here and talk to the camera. So, um, what were we talking about? Crew served weapons. <laughs> crew served weapons. like a tank is a crew served weapon. So theoretically, if they would have rolled out with a tank, we could have shot at them. Um, I if, think uh, if people are, I mean, I'm probably wrong, but if people are looking for that RPK, uh, American Sniper, like the guy that he was after all the mm -hmm, time, he mm -hmm. had one, I think. Yeah, RPK is RPK is a it's a popular it's a popular gun just because it 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 hold it it dissipates the heat better than an AK, so you can you can put more rounds down range before your uh, your thing is catching on fire. Uh, so it's pretty popular. Uh, but again, every place you go, there's specific rules of engagement. Like uh, American Sniper, you know, Kyle did not have. When Kyle was in Fallujah, I am almost 100% sure that there were no rules of engagement. Now, you still have to follow the rules of law or the rules of war. So, like, you know, you can't just burst into a school and start machine gunning people up. That's just, it's frowned upon, right? But uh, as far as, uh, as far as, uh, Fallujah's concern when he went in there, I'm sure that there were no rules of engagement because uh, I know the Marine Corps didn't have any the first time we went in. The second time, I do believe that there were some ROEs, but ROEs change and they're flexible and they're never the same. So, you know, the, the ROEs that we had in Mogadishu were generated by the UN. They were not generated by U.S. forces. Um, so that so theoretically, those ROEs would only be used within the confines of the UN and not uh, why, um, American forces. If, if if America is the one that's doing it, why like why are they putting restrictions on their own guys? Because at the time, you know, when we were in when we were in Mogadishu, we were we, don't forget we had a Democratic president, Bill Clinton, and we were operating under the UN flag, so we weren't independent. We were operating under the UN flag, meaning Boutros Ghali was technically in charge of all forces in country. So he had the last say. That's that's kind of why the that's kind of why the um, the Delta and the Rangers had such a problem was because the command structure the command structure in a UN uh, operation is so convoluted and so misrepresented that. Every time they they would have to brief the UN on, hey, this is what we're going to do. This is what we're going to go. This is how we're going to do it. And then they would get there and it'd be a dry hole. It's because people in the UN were telling Adid and other warlords, hey, guess what? They're coming. Yeah. Right? So, like, when you see the when you see Black Hawk down and the guy is sitting outside with the cell phone and he sees the helicopter fly away and he's like, oh, let me make a phone call and tell them that they're coming. Um, 
they did do that. They did watch the base because it was very easy to see, you know, the, the airfield. It was very easy to see that aircraft taking off from the airfield. Yeah. But they, he would not know what the target was. It was the UN, UN individuals. I'm not going to say, uh, you know, that the UN is totally bad because there, there's, you know, there was great people there, but it was people within the UN that were telling the, you know, Adid and the other warlords, hey, Delta is coming to the Olympia Hotel to take you guys down. Um, so they were, and that's why they did that raid the way they did it, and they didn't tell anybody. And that's why, you know, when they when they needed the help, they needed everybody was like. You didn't tell us. Why didn't you tell us? But that you know, it, it's because they don't have the same. Um, Did we kill everybody over there we wanted to kill? No, we didn't kill everybody over there we wanted to kill. They they after <clears throat> after uh, Black Hawk down, they sequestered those Rangers quick, fast, in a hurry, and shipped those Delta guys out fast, Why? quick, in a hurry because they didn't want them to go on a blood feud. You know, they didn't want them to go out there and just really wreak havoc. Even though, I mean, those dudes and the <laughs> those dudes and the little birds like. If I wasn't there, but if I was a ranger or a Delta yeah. guy and, and I was aware of what those dudes in the little birds were doing, I would be like, yeah, blood feud, you know, blood feud is settled. Cause they were, you know, they 6,000 rounds a minute guys. And they running, were making running multiple out runs, of ammo. running out of, out of ammo. They weren't shooting bricks. They weren't shooting rocks. They were shooting Somalis. Lots of them. I mean, they, they hosed them down. Uh, I mean, not, not that the you know that the Rangers and the Delta guys didn't do their fair share either. I mean, if 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 uh, you stack the numbers up, right, it was definitely not a fair. Like we lost seventeen. I've heard <laughs> I've heard anywhere of a hundred thousand Somalis were killed wow. that day. Did they, did they have rockets? The little birds. I'm sure they did. They weren't using them. No, no, I, I bet they did. I mean, they they were th when they were going into support. When they were going into support, when they had targets, they were firing everything. I mean, they were they were smoke clearing. Those guys were out of ammo. So, guys, I've got about uh, twelve questions here that you guys asked. Um, we're not going to have time to get to those today. If you like these stories and you'd like to hear more, there are more. And uh, if you want to hear them, leave some comments on this video when you see it, and uh, we'll let you guys kind of. Uh, guide the direction that this we members, right? go. Uh, yeah, it's members. So members on, only. On Monday afternoon, there will be a post. Every Monday afternoon, there will be a post saying, if you have a comment for these guys, yeah. comment. Do we, are we going to get, if we're doing members only um, questions, Yes. do we get to wear the jackets? Yes. Oh, man, that's awesome. Yeah, I haven't whatever, worn a members only jacket in probably. Whatever, whatever you want. Probably my, thirty years. My dad just brought my. Can I get one red? I, I had, a, like I had long hair and a mullet, so mine had like a grease ring around the collar. <laughs> so we do the whole podcast like this, but then when it comes time to questions, it goes into an '80s. We put VCR kind of effects over everything. Members only jackets. I mean, if we can, we even button. hey, uh, let John know in the comments if you know where we can get a members only jacket. Oh, we'll find some. <laughs> um, so we put these up private. Start taking cuts like five minute clips out and put them up public all right we'll go uh we'll film this other thing real quick so jeff can get out of here what's the other thing oh